Pretty quiet. The chair will call the October 5th, 2021 meeting of the City Council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Clerk, if you'd please call the roll. Well, Dave. <coughs> Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderman Williams. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderwoman Purchase. Here. Alderwoman Desenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. I think we do have a uh, presentation by Baker Tilly to start the meeting or, or with regards to the audit. If you'd like to come forward and state your name, we'd appreciate it. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Joe Lightcap. I'm a partner with Baker Tilly. Uh, we're the independent auditors for the city of Springfield. Uh, tonight I'll be going over a very high level, the um, comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended February 28th, 2021, as well as our audit results communication. Um, I'll be going, as I mentioned, be going over to high level. Um, if you've seen the reports, you have any questions, feel free to stop me at any, at any point to ask questions. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Office of, of um, Budget and Management for their help during the audit. We ask a lot of questions. We, we bug them quite a bit. Um, and they're very good about getting us good answers in a very timely manner. I will start with the comprehensive annual financial report, which the name suggests is a comprehensive document. It's more comprehensive than what's required uh, under accounting standards. It includes um, some additional transmittal uh, language about the city and some historical tenure trend information in the back of the report. It's very good to, to see how the, the city's done over the last 10 years. Um, it's a higher level of transparency than is required, um, and the, the report is then submitted to GFOA to receive the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. The first part of the report I want to go to is page one, the Independent Auditor's Report. Uh, I'm not sure if we have that report. We don't have it. I, I'll, I'll talk in, hopefully, in enough terms to, to give you the, the okay. rundown of what I'm going over. So we, guess, we issued a clean... Uh, sorry to interrupt, but nope. uh, just so it's on record, Director McCarty needs to provide the report <laughs> when the auditors come. Oh, is he here? There he is. I did. I said it to everybody. Okay. Via email or what? Last week, I think. Is it email? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So uh, yeah. I think if the Citizen council members want to log in, you, said, yeah. you can log into your email. That'd be great. Sorry, Bill. I didn't know you were there. But I'd say it regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. So we issued a clean or unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements. It's the highest level of assurance you can gain from your outside auditors. And it states that the information within is reasonable in all material respects and can be reasonably relied upon by an outside user of the financial statements. Um, an emphasis of matter uh, this year in the opinion on page two is that the city adopted GASB 83, which is a new accounting standard over asset retirement obligations. So if the city has a legal obligation, a legally enforceable obligation to retire an asset and, and do it a certain way um, at the end of its life, you're required to record a liability now. So that's a new um, liability offset by uh, 
a contra liability um, deferred outflow of resources uh, during the year. The next um, section, the management's discussion and analysis, that's the where I always direct um, my governing bodies to look at. It's a report written, written by management. It goes over the changes um, compared to the prior year, so the current year compared to the prior year, and, and it's written in a lot easier terms than, than the rest of the report, and it's just a good overview of, of what happened financially during the year. After that is um, statements one and two. These are the full accrual statements of the city. This has all of the funds, um, both governmental activities and business type activities. It, it's all in, uh, all funds in two columns. It has capital assets, long-term liabilities, long-term debt, net pension liabilities. Um, so it's, it's pretty much all the accounts and funds uh, of the city on a long-term basis. Statement two shows net position decreasing across the city um, by about 31.3 million. Governmental activities increased by 30.7 million, uh, mainly due to the spending of, of funds on capital improvements and capital projects, uh, and, and the, pay, the spend down of long, or the repayment of long-term debt. Business type activities decreased about by about 61.9 million. This was mainly due to the decommissioning, uh, the plant decommissioning that happened during the year. Statements three and five, these are more of what you would be used to seeing on a, on a monthly basis or periodic basis. This is the more short-term short perspective of the city's governmental funds. Um, so it's broken down by major funds and a combination um, column for non-major funds. Statement five shows an overall decrease in fund balance of about 5.1 million. The general fund increased 5.8 million. The motor fuel tax fund, another major fund, de decreased by about 3.8 million. This was mainly due to spending on projects where the, the reimbursement will occur later on. It's not a short-term receipt of revenue, so it's not recorded in this in this fund, but the expenditures were fund, so it's, it'd be more than reimbursed um, in fiscal year 22. The non-major funds had a decrease in fund balance of about 7.2 million, and this was related to the spend down of fund balance on capital improvements um, and capital equipment. Statement six, so I, I mentioned a couple of numbers. I mentioned the, the net position for governmental activities increasing by about 31.3 million, or sorry, 30.7 million, and fund balance going down um, by about 5.1 million. So a very large gap between the, the first statements, which are long-term, full accrual, and the second um, statements that are more of a short-term basis. Statement six gives you kind of the reasons why. So when you spend on capital improvements, that helps your net position. When you spend down long-term debt, that also helps. Um, but then your, your, long, your net pension liabilities and OPEB liabilities, if they increase, that'll, that'll decrease your net position. So statement six kind of gives you that, that um, roadmap between the two bases of accounting. Statements seven through nine show a breakdown of the business type activities by fund. So the electric fund, the water fund, and the non-major funds, Oak Ridge, sewer, and motor vehicle. The, that, those statements are on the same basis of accounting as the front schedules. Business type activities are all on a full accrual long-term perspective. Understanding that, that maybe not everyone saw the, the report um, nope. before now, is there any questions or anything that I said or anything that you've seen that you would like to go over? Otherwise, I'll go to the next report. Okay. So the other report is our reporting and insights from the 2021 audit. This is the non-financial highlights of our audit. It, this letter is designed to satisfy a few different auditing standards. It discusses our responsibilities, management's responsibilities, um, if there were any significant changes to our audit plan, where are some key areas of focus for our audit uh, and those matters. A lot of that is, is pretty standard information. Um, and doesn't, doesn't change too much year over year. 
There is a section um, for internal control related matters. When we come in to do the city's audit, we look at internal controls to help determine the nature, timing, and extent of our audit procedures. Not necessarily to provide an opinion on internal controls to the city, um, but if there are things that we find that we feel um, should, the council should be aware of, we put those in this letter. This year, there were two comments, um, the results of audit adjustments that were determined during the year. The city has put in procedures to help mitigate this going forward, um, and we're very quick to, to help us through um, rectifying these adjustments. So while these comments, um, we haven't had comments in the past for the city, um, I think that is a testament to the, to the, the diligence of the Office of Management and Budget, and it's pretty rare amongst our, your peers to not have any comments. The final part um, is the two-way communications regarding your audit. It's a bunch of different things that, that questions to pique your interest. If there's any ever any questions or concerns that you have over the city's finances or our audit, um, we're happy to answer those at any time. And page two of this report has my email and phone number. If there's ever any questions, feel free to reach out to me at, at any time. Thank With you. that, I'll, I'll once again open it up to questions. Any questions or comments? Alderwoman Conley, then Alderman Repath. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for coming in. I did find the email. This is the one with like 14 or 15 attachments. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I have it. I'm just, I guess what I was, I wanted to ask, did you, did you break the 100 and some odd page report up into multiple attachments? No, no, they're different. If you could come up to the uh, microphone. Right. No, I, I understand. So I guess I've, I understood there's, there's the one large one that is the comprehensive report, and that's, that's good to know. Um, were there any other findings in these uh, other attached reports that we need to be looking at? I mean, it, I, I did kind of, I looked through things. I didn't, I did not read all of them yet. I'll be fully honest. It's, it's a lot. But you know, you, you go over the the pension funds. You look at um, the electric fund, water funds. Um, there were no major issues in any of those that you found in terms of auditing. Correct. Correct. The, okay. the, there were there were no, except for the two adjustments I mentioned. There were no other large adjustments identified by the auditors. And just a quick point of clarification: we we do look at the net pension liability in the actuary reports, but you have other auditors that audit the police and firefighters' pension. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Redpath. You know, I appreciate the fact that our, our finance area decided to put this on, uh, give it to us on an email, but it's hard to follow a, prog a, a report like this when you don't have it in front of you. And most of us, even if we briefly looked at it, we need it here. I mean, this is, this is un un uh, you know, this is ridiculous. We should not have to sit here and listen to a guy tell us the stuff and go on page seven this, and then on page 10 this. We have no idea. We're sitting here listening to something we don't have any idea. This is a, this is a very important report, and I encourage you, Mayor, in the future to have your director be more prepared and make sure that we either have a presentation up on the screen or we have a report sitting on our desk. Thank you. I agree. Alderman Conley. Sorry, just one more question. Um, obviously, because people in the audience couldn't follow along without something on the screen, where is this going to be posted on our website? Uh, Director McCarty can answer that. I believe it's already posted. If it's not, it will be in the open government section. Just off the first page, look for open government. All of our transparency reports are there. What are and the report you want to focus on is the big one. That's the CAFR. But those are all a bunch of different individual reports. And we had reference in the email that we would be going over some of those reports. We didn't print them because the one CAFR alone is 257 pages. So I'm sorry, um, Director, and I just indulged me. The open government is under which tab? Uh, Julia here, she can, I think at the top there's like government services and then there's a drop down menu and it says open government or something like that. I'm not terribly familiar with the website to be able to reference it off the top of my head, but I know if you go to springfield.il.us. Which is where I am. At the top there's some options and then there's like a, I think a drop down or something that says open government. Treasurer Busher might be able to tell you. 
Director, I'm on the website for you. Since you don't have a computer in front of you, yes, go to the Open Government tab and scroll down about a quarter of the way down, and you'll see the words Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports, and it has been uploaded, Director. Thank you. I just, I guess, okay, I, I'm just saying it's, it's not easy to find on a mobile device, which is how a lot of people access things, too. I, I'm not seeing Open Government, but I'll, I'll keep looking. That's right. fine. I just... This is, it is important, and we do appreciate the audit, and I think Alderman Redpath made it quite clear that it's important that the residents of Springfield can access this easily, too. Yeah. So. Yep, it's there for everybody to see. All right. Yeah, just to clarify, I don't know if you're um, on your handheld device, if you, on the tab across the top, the second one in says residents. You click on residents, and then the it should pop up under there as a quick links, and one of those quick links is to open government. Thank you, Mayor, very much. That's, I'm tech, was, that's what I'm I was tech missing. challenged. I like it right there in my face. <laughs> 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 well, I don't have to drill down too much. Thank you for But I didn't know if the presentation you gave was any different from if you could synthesize that and email it to Director McCarty, and then we can... Uh, circulate it with the council members and post it. That'd be great. Alderman Redpath. A follow-up question. Are you are you guys the one that do the audits on the, the bars and restaurants for gaming? We do uh, not. Who does that? Is that under Todd Oliver? Um, you got it. Sorry. Director McCarty will answer it. I believe OBM has been doing that, but I'm not sure who the... I do it. So where are we at on those? Mm, let's see, what are we in? We usually do them in January or February after the renewals come in. We didn't do them last year because of the pandemic. So are we the, We have those underway right now? We did, uh, well, we do a third a year, and again, we didn't do one last year. The prior year, we did a third randomly chosen of the ones who were not grandfathered, and all of them were in compliance. Because I know all of us are getting complaints about businesses not complying with what our rules are. So we need to, mm -hmm. we need to turn that up, or we need to... Uh, increase our, our audits. What I would encourage any of you to do, if you get a complaint about a specific entity, let me know and I can do an audit immediately. Won't Thank be a problem. You. Well, happy to do that. To that note, uh, you know, you've mentioned that you're, and we've had many conversations about this very topic in this chamber, you've mentioned that a third a year are going to be done. So if we do turn one in, they will immediately get audited? We don't have to wait for the one No, I can do it tomorrow if you give me a name. Yeah. I just have to pull the data. All I have to do is pull the data from the Illinois gaming site on what their sales have been, and then I have to go in a Department of Revenue and look at their actual sales, total sales, from a sales tax standpoint because gaming's not... And then I compare the two, and and I get the percentage that way. And and that's really good to know. I appreciate that mm -hmm. because I don't sure. unless I don't want to speak for everybody, but I did not know that. I don't know if any of us knew that because we, when we bring it up before in this chamber, we were told, well, it's not the time of the year to do the audit. We're going to do the audit. And then you were you good enough last time when we asked the question. You provided us the most recent data and right. it showed who was audited, and you know that was mm -hmm. that was a very good report. But this is the first I've heard of that, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a specific name. I can do it in a day. Well, we all, at least I assume everybody else gets those complaints, so yep. they will absolutely be passed along to you. Ha happy to do it. Thank no you, problem. Sir. Won't be a problem at all. Any other uh, questions or comments? Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your report. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, I want to do a uh, brief introduction. Uh, we have some individuals from the Office of Planning and Economic Development Department with us. And with the previous discussions, I thought it'd be good to put a name with the face so they come forward real quick and introduce themselves um, and a little bit what their tasks or what they're working on. That'd yeah, be great. Come on up. First is uh, Robbie Doshi, and if they'd all file in so we can keep it moving. <laughs> there we go. Hi, my name is Robbie Doshi. I think I'm too tall for this mic, um, but I'd first like to thank you, Mayor, and all the council uh, members here in attendance for having us here on behalf of myself and the OPET team. Uh, my name is Ravi Doshi. I am the Economic Development Officer for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. Um, my principal duties include uh, the administration and management of TIF projects 
throughout the city, uh, as well as the coordination of economic development projects within the city. But uh, our focus here uh, is one of collaboration, interagency, as well as intra-agency, and that is to expedite as well as provide accurate information on individuals who inquire or have inquiries related to rehabilitation, planning, development. We want to take a more proactive approach. You know, so we've drastically changed the way that we initiate our outreach, which is having more boots to the ground, as well as any inquiries that we do get into our office. We're not only looking into the program or the complaint that they are prescribing or they are advocating for, but also proactively looking into programs that they may be able to qualify for. So we are tracking all of that data as well. Um, Mesfin, who does our GIS uh, analysis, also uh, tracks all that data for us. I've been working intimately. Uh, also, one of my duties is to integrate all the various aspects that uh, come into our, our department on one platform. So if you've had a chance to see our website, that has also been uh, changed to list programs and incentives you know, that we are offering uh, listed by ward, listed by various demographic information. Um, also, our office just recently completed an 897 parcel mailer, which is actually one of the largest that we've ever done in the last 13 years in regards to the SHA expansion, uh, which you'll be hearing more about. Uh, we'll have our public meeting for that on October 18th, as well as our public hearing on October 25th for that expansion. So we look very forward to that. I'd like to thank our receptionist, Elizabeth, Zone, Elizabeth Jones, for helping us with that. It was an extensive mailer, as well as uh, Donna Devlantis, who isn't here with us, you know, who is our grants coordinator uh, for acquiring and writing the various grants to be administered by our office. You know, so those are uh, some of my duties uh, that I have. I also sit as the city's liaison on the economic and committee, I'm sorry, the economic and community development commission. Um, so I uh, sit on that. We will have our first meeting this month for that as well. So. Right. Just some Thank of you. our duties. And then uh, Mesfin, he's changed duties. He's over the enterprise uh, zone areas and other items. So Mesfin, if you'd reintroduce yourself, that'd be great. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mesfin Lent, and I'm the GIS, uh, Geographic Information System Analyst, and as well as Business Projects Manager. Um, no worries if you don't get my first name. It might seem abnormal, uh, considering I'm originally from uh, East Africa, Ethiopia. Um, just a little bit about me, I studied economics um, and political science at Illinois College in Jacksonville, Illinois. Um, I worked at Governor's Office of Management and Budget for 14 months and uh, decided to get my graduate degree at um, UIS in uh, Public Administration. And uh, I completed a DCEO internship there uh, as well. Um, I met uh, some of you in person. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet everyone and uh, show my face here at the City Council. Uh, I've been working at OPED for about two years now, and uh, I'm grateful and passionate about what, uh, what I do uh, for the city of Springfield. Uh, I specifically administer the Enterprise Zone Program, uh, Cannabis Grant Program, TIF Exterior Rehab, Staff Liaison for Historic Sites Commission, uh, and provide maps and demographics and business-related data for grants application and as well as community uh, organizations. Um, so uh, yeah, if you have any questions regarding those programs, I would be able to uh, answer, um, and uh, I love collaborating with uh, various uh, departments, um, whether it's CWLP, um, applying for grants for boats accessible, um, or um, for uh, various uh, community development, um, and uh, so yeah, that's uh, a little bit about me, and uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you. And then uh, Chris Dukolis, she's in uh, charge of our housing and community development black grant funds. Hello, everyone. I, I think I've uh, been here before a couple times, but uh, I'm the operations coordinator. I am managing the community development and housing HUD funds for uh, the city. I um, have been managing federal funds for 28 years through grant funds. I first came to the city in 2010, uh, and I managed the um, CWLP Energy Services Office um, era grants. So um, came back uh, last April. Tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things we've been doing. <clears throat> we were able to get the 2019 CDBG CB3 and substantial amendment submitted, the 2020-24 consolidated plan and 2020 action plan, the 2021 
annual action plan, the 2020 CAPER. We meet with HUD monthly. It's the last Wednesday of every month. If anybody ever wants to, you know, come and see what we're doing, you're more than welcome to come into the office. We speak with our, oh, her, her uh, name is Taylor Kylie. She's our CPD representative. And I think we talk to her every other day, twice, three, four times a week. So uh, we are speaking to HUD quite a bit. Uh, we're ensuring that your funds are being used uh, properly, managed properly. Anytime you guys need reports, you have folks that are in need of assistance, please refer them to our office. We're filtering them right in. We have all kinds of wonderful programs. Most recently, um, our office, OPED, was uh, the recipient of a $3.4 million lead grant. We want to thank our OPED and our OBM partners on that. Without the work of our two offices, we would not have been able to secure that. This uh, grant is going to assist 169 very low, low to moderate income households with uh, kids that may have elevated blood lead levels. Um, just recently, September 21st, we applied for another $2 million grant to assist more homes in Springfield or their healthy homes and uh, any kind of um, health hazards that they might have in their home. We're working with the Illinois Department of Public Health, Sangamon County Public Health, SIU School of Medicine, and there's many more, and I can't think of them right now, and I apologize to anybody. But we do want to thank our, our partners at OBM for all their help with uh, getting these grants. Um, in the door, we'll be negotiating next month, or next week, I'm sorry, next week for our um, lead grant with HUD, and we hope to hear in the next month about our two million healthy homes production. So send your folks over. We've got a lot of funds. We want to get them out the door, and uh, we need your help to do it. So we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And then last but not least is Aaron Horwath. Um, he's the finance officer for OPET. Good evening. Uh, my name is Aaron Horwath. I'm the fiscal officer for OPET. I'm with the Office of Budget Management. Um, I support the various programs that they have at OPED uh, with, through billing, invoicing, um, and reporting. Okay, short and sweet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all, the, all the women just said so. Thank you, Mayor. Just a quick question. Who does everyone report to since there isn't a director and hasn't been since March? The mayor is our Current, yeah. The mayor's your director. Yes. Really? Currently, I report to Julie Zolgadar and of course. my director, Bill McCarty. Thank you get you. double pay for that? Um, <laughs> no. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Thank you. Actually, with the uh, finance uh, office, uh, Director McCarty's been working with us to uh, kind of consolidate uh, and plan for succession. So if someone walks out the door, you have a backup plan with finance officers. In the past, you'd always have a finance person in public works or uh, economic development or convention visitors bureau and so this way we're able to uh, take advantage of the talent that we have and pool that together and actually plan for succession if someone's out alderman gregory i just uh you know i have uh, met these young men and and and, and miss krista i've worked with her before but i, I do want to say that um they bring a, a, a different energy, all, all, all of this team. They bring a different energy. I've seen some success in our community with really getting down and trying to match people up with funds. So I, I look forward to working with these gentlemen and, and young lady um, for a better community. I, th I think this is a good team. And, of course, we need a director, and I hope you get that roles. <laughs> yeah, we will. Uh, <clears throat> eventually, we're getting the right pieces in place, which uh, we have a talented group. And so feel free to reach out to any one of them. If you have any questions uh, related to their expertise, or let me know. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Chair will entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the September 21st, 2021 City Council meeting and so approve the minutes. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances into the record of the City Council meeting. So moved. Second. 
I move and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain the motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of the city council. So move, Mayor. Move. Second. Good move and second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So move. Second. The movement second. Any discussion? Uh, discussion, Mayor. Alderman McMenamin. I'll be uh, a no vote for 2021-398. I'm in favor of the sports legacy con uh, complex, but I'm uh, the, the financing of it using uh, s such significant tax dollars is, is my problem. But on this particular proposal, 398, there's a question about whether we are extending the business district. 13 years or 20 years? That question arose last week during the Committee of the Whole, and do we have an answer on that question? Uh, yes, we are. We, the proposal is to extend it 13. Uh, there's, I think, a reference in the uh, whereas clause to refer to 23 years, but that would be the total. And 23 years is the maximum that's allowed under the state statute. So. Can you give us the termination date for the business? Uh, I can get that for you. I don't. I, I don't remember if it's listed in the ordinance. It's 13 years from. Um, That's really my question. I mean, it's, 13 it's, years from today's date, or 13 years from a future date, and I just—it's been unclear last week, and it remains unclear. Okay. The intent is 13 years from the current termination date, for a total of 23. And it's my understanding, I don't have it right in front of me on the existing termination date. I think it's in the development agreement, it's my memory. Uh, but I believe it's 11 years from now, or 10 years and a half. So the 13 years was to add 13 to get to a total of 23, which is the maximum the city's allowed to do. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And the statute, to give some comfort on that, the, stat, the state law sets out that 23-year maximum term. Thank you. And Mr. Clerk, you've got the no vote for that. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. Any other uh, questions or comments on the consent agenda? All those in favor of the consent agenda, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the consent agenda passes 10 voting yes, none voting no, and Alderman McMinimum voting no on 2021-398. Thank you. Agenda's numbers 2021-239, 2021-336, 2021-337, 2021-365, 2021 and 2021-370 remain tabled during committee. Next item on the agenda is 2021-371, an ordinance to decrease the number of Class C liquor licenses by one and increase the number of Class B liquor licenses by one for High B Inc. Doing business as High B C store located at 1025 Outer Park Drive. Chair will entertain a motion to place Mr. agenda number 2021-371 on final passage. Mr. Mayor, I'd ask the council to hold this again. I talked with uh, Todd Oliver who I don't believe is here. He's our liquor commissioner administrator. And the correct person to, I need some information about the intent of this uh, lic liquor license. And the correct person, according to Todd, to talk with is their cor cor a corporate person in Iowa by the name of Kelly Palmer. I've called Kelly Palmer three times and left three voice messages and haven't been able to get a, a reply. So with the council's indulgence, I'd just like to hold this till we get a, a reply. And move and second to holding committee. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is 2021-378, a resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that motor fuel tax rebuild funds, the amount of $317,121, may be used for construction phase engineering services, PE3, for the downtown traffic signals modernization and one-way street conversion project, MFT section number 19-00489-00-TL for the Office of Public Works. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2021-378 on final passage. So moved. Second. 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 Moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <laughs> 
And the motion passes eight voting yes, none, one voting no, and one voting present. Next item on the agenda is 2021-379, an ordinance authorizing an agreement for construction phase engineering services PE-3 with Knight Engineering Inc. for the downtown traffic signal modernization and one-way street conversion project in an amount not to exceed $317,121 for the Office of Public Works. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2021-379 on final passage. Move to consent. Second. We have moved and second for passage and uh, second, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes eight voting yes, one voting no, one voting present. Next item on the agenda is 2021-390, an ordinance amending chapter 170, section 17.58 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to the registration of vacant buildings. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2021-390 on final passage. Mr. Mayor, I, I would like uh, to hold this. Um, there, there is a young man here um, to speak on behalf of uh, some concerned individuals, if, if we can have him speak. Second. Been moved and second to for discussion? Yes. And second for discussion. Uh, someone in the audience wants to come forward and speak to this? Hi, my name is uh, Colin Sisko. I'm the local government affairs director with the uh, Capital Area Realtors. And for this, um, for this amendment, um, one of the changes would be changing the, uh, the timeline from three years to one year for a certificate of occupancy or a de demolish a building. And we believe that that will disincentivize uh, investors to come in and revitalize these properties if they so choose. Um, we just think that the one year period can cause a lot of disincentivization, disincentiv in <coughs> disincentivizations to uh, come and revitalize. So we would like to work with Alderman Gregory and try to fix up this language. So I, I, I don't have a problem. I talked to uh, also someone, Alderman McMenamin and, and, and some other Alderman um, about this. I don't have a problem with it because we, you know, for me, it's, it's really not to get after anybody who's in good faith really trying to develop our community. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we have so many houses that we're really past the point of, 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 of it taking too long to get them, get them back. So we really are looking to get after this. Um, but with that, I, I'm, I'm fine with holding it for a few weeks and, and work with you guys and, and try to come up with something uh, for everyone. I, I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think one of the concerns that that, that I've had with it, uh, and, and I'm for this ordinance. Uh, I've, I've talked to Sean about it, Alderman Gregory about it. Um, and Mr. Zirkel, I guess this question's for you. As long, once, if we go to court, on one of these properties, we can't. We, I mean, if it's if it hits a year, and we go to court to get the court, you know, allow it to be torn down. If the court says we got to wait until we contact the owner, or whatever, we can't do anything, right? I mean, one of the concerns I think Mr. Cisco had was, okay, what's what happens if it's in the court process? And I don't. We can't go against the court, can we? I, yeah, if it's already in the court process, you're yeah, saying? if it's already in the court process, you know, going through the court process, uh, let's say they're having a hard time finding an out of town owner. Um, what what happens on that? How's that? Well, the in order to uh, proceed in court, you're going to have to end up uh, just from a due process point of view, uh, being able to get service on all owners, you know, so they have notice. You know, that's a definition of. Uh, the uh, any kind of administrative or court process, uh, whether circuit court or in the uh, administrative court. And really the uh, issue with this is how long, what's the, if you will, the waiting period to get the process started. And so the current process, uh, and again, in my own view, is that these things become almost evolutionary, meaning you put things in place, you watch them, see how they work, and then you try to refine them and make them better. So the issue here is do we benefit from trying to shorten the time frame in order to get the process started you know sooner but the 
reality is that we're always faced with, uh, and everybody here I think has a strong understanding of that, you know, there's really a couple of three categories of properties, and, you know, either the property is truly almost like abandoned, meaning the current owner is, you know, letting, the, letting it go for taxes, you know, they're just not doing anything, it's just sitting there. Or maybe a person owns it, but they don't have the resources. So when you start getting into that, the sooner you can identify what category to put it in, it's, and, and that's all this process was designed to do, is to try to move the process to move more quickly and not let it simply be there for three years. So that was the, the original intent. Uh, but you certainly have to allow due process, you know, to property owners with, without question. Or, or they're not bound. If they're not served, what ends up happening in civil cases many times is if they're not served, if they don't participate, then they're not bound by the order. Alderman Donlin? Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, just, I think it would be helpful if we could have a brief discussion, since we're talking about this this evening, on the existing, the existing city code. And my understanding is the existing city code, we're not talking about properties that are, let's say, someone's uh, moved to Florida and they're selling their house and it's vacant and empty, or, or uh, let's say a space at the mall, as an example, that is, has been vacant for a while. We're talking about problem properties and that are vacant, and then they get on the list. And what I, what I think would be helpful for us to hear is uh, the present code says three years, but how often are those properties inspected? Do we wait till the three years is up and then start ins ins and then inspect the property, or do we inspect them as we go along once they're placed on the list? Can somebody uh, add some clarification for that for us this evening? Well, I, th I think I, I probably Public Works would have to address that. But uh, I think the way the process works is when they get into the registration mode, then they almost are put on the shelf, you know, absent some very material change, like maybe a roof falls in or something very serious. So um, the uh, process, there's, there's a volume involved. So uh, the, I'm sure they are periodically reviewed, but not in the sense of, uh, uh, other than just monitoring pending the ex expiration of that three-year period because the under the current code, a property owner does have that full three-year period to continue to make the, you know, payments. You know, you have a registration payment, and that was the original intent, I think, going back many years, was right. thinking that people wouldn't want to pay the registration fee because it's uh, uh, several hundred dollars uh, per year. And so... But what's happened is, as, we, as this has evolved, um, you're still ending up with quite a few properties on the uh, registration list where the owner is not, you know, maybe taking steps, can't take steps, not interested in taking steps, but under our code, we're giving, we're waiting the full three years. So, uh, again, it's, to me, it's kind of an evolutionary process. You kind of see what works and then you know, you go in and try to adjust it, or and, and maybe it turns out that the one year is too short, or maybe we end up finding out that half of the ones on registration are really abandoned. So you start getting them in a category, so you know what to, what the next steps are. Well, I appreciate that explanation, I, and I know Public Works is going to add add to it. Um, you know, if we if we did indeed cut it, uh, let me let me let me. Uh, go into this first before I go that route. My understanding is that the, under existing code that once it's a uh, property's put on a three-year list, if a entity, organization, individual, whoever owns the property is making progress, in other words, trying to abate the problems that put it on the list in the first place, that the city has the present ability to work with the property owner, extend Absolutely. the time frame, and uh, even like if it's three, two years and, and 11 months, then and we're approaching that, there's an administrative court hearing, it can be extended. But obviously all of our goals is to get the property cleaned up and, and uh, we don't want, uh, I, I wouldn't think so at least, the, the city doesn't want to spend money on demolishing buildings. We want to uh, put our resources elsewhere. It's, you know, it'd be great to have the private investment to, to uh, make the buildings viable again. But I think the, the point of the, the court process is it was a good question. I appreciate you bringing it up because uh, it, regardless if it's one year or like it is now three years, we still have that process in place and the due process is there. But, uh, you know, I'm, 
Well, Alderman Gregory, it sounds like you're taking the lead on some of the changes. I'd love to talk to you about some of these things sure. because uh, sure. it doesn't sound like we're too far away uh, to, to making this work. It seems like there might be some way to compromise, even if it was the three-year period where it was inspected, maybe on a regular basis and progress is being made. I, I don't know, just as a thought, and but something we could talk about later. But if we can hear from Public Works, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, they can come up, or Daryl, and then Alderwoman Conley. Does Mr. Cisco have anything else before we report? Uh, did you have anything else, or you can come up? Uh, I was just going to say that in, in the current vacant property registration code, it's not very clear on how the city handles if an individual does take, take over a property, a vacant registered property, and is working towards revitalizing it. There's no clear indication in the current code on whether or not what the city can do. So it's kind of just up in the air. The city can pick and choose. So I would like to see some more strict language that says like what the city can and can't do for when somebody comes in and tries to revitalize these properties. Yeah, we'll add clarity to that point. All the women Conley, then all the women DeCento. Did you want um, Director? Adam yeah, to come up if he wants to come first. up and. I think Alderman, clarity on Alderman the process. Alderman Donnellan had questions. Yeah, Thank but, you. <laughs> and to be fair, actually, Alderman Donnellan and Mr. Sisko actually asked my questions for me. So, okay. um, again, I just, I will involve, go ahead, Director, sorry. Hi, Nate. Glad you're Hi. here. Yeah. Hi, Director. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Yeah, so our ultimate goal is to get compliance. Uh, we want people to pick some up, um, and that was that was part of the goal is to uh, help expedite the process because a, a property vacant for three years is going to be dilapidated and continue to deteriorate. So ultimately, we wanted to get to that one year goal, and and our ultimate goal is for them to fix it up. So we do work with with the owners whenever we can in order for them to fix it up. Um, we do a periodic inspections, especially if they're working on it, to um, see if they deserve that extension as well. Um, or if we do get a complaint that, uh, you know, it's um, somebody took down the boarding or something along those lines, then we have to uh, put the boarding back up. So we do periodic inspections, both proactively and, and reactive if we're in the area or if we get a complaint. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Appreciate it, Director. Yep. Alderwoman Conley, then Desenzo, then Alderman Repath. Thank you. And, and I just, just to clarify, um, I, I appreciate that, that, that description. Um, I actually do support this one year change, but I would, I agree that we need to have something in here that kind of codifies that, that approach, just in case someone else should be the new director. Um, sure. I, you're not laughing at me at that one, but no, but just because that, that is, that is an approach that, 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 that has customer service sort of an orientation to it, that we're ensuring that these buildings as best as possible are moving back into into active product, you know, being actively used. I think three years is too long to stay on there. And you, again, as Alderman Gregory pointed out, you get buildings start to fall apart if no one's working on them. Um, this gives a little more incentive to get moving. But I, I do think if we need to, you know, if we could possibly add some language in here that just says, um, you know, in the subsection C where we're talking about kind of, or even the, the last section, um, that just recognizes that good faith, um, good faith efforts by the owner, whether it be the original owner or, or a new one, that the, those will be taken into account in terms of ending, you know, moving to that next phase. So, so thank we'll you. We'll work with code enforcement and legal in order to get. Yeah, and, and then I mean, you can leave good faith, at, but something that recognizes that if you're doing something, you've got people working, but it's not occupant ready. That's great. But I think three years is, is actually too long, and we need to keep this heat on. Thank you. Thank you. Alderwoman Desenzo. Um, I'm going to echo that three years is too long, but I think we've all seen properties in our ward that start work and then stop. Yep. And they stop for long periods of time, or they do the necessary cosmetic work, and then they stop and leave a mess, and then maybe they'll start again. But, I mean, you know, three years is way, way too long. And I think a lot of us are very impatient with this and we want to get this passed because um, frankly, we're all tired of getting the phone calls about this sort of thing. And I'm sure you're tired of hearing from us as well. <laughs> you don't have to nod on that one. <laughs> Never tired of us. 
I, I, I agree with Alderman Gregory's uh, ordinance, and I, I want to say that uh, there is value, though, to talk with the, the real estate people to come up with the, it, It's not about going after everybody. It's Alderman Donlin made it clear that this is about a progressive thing where we're going to uh, go after the ones that are problem properties, and those are the ones we got to get cleaned up. And I've sat on this council for a long time, as, as others have, and we've all seen where the absent landlords are the ones that are the biggest problems. We have people from Chicago who dare us to sue them, and, and then they'll just take us to court and we never get out of court. So this is a good ordinance, but we do need to uh, recognize some of the comments from the young man. I'm glad you're going to meet with him, and hopefully Alderman Donlin will be involved in those discussions Absolutely. and give us some in input. But this is a, an important ordinance to, for our city to get a lot of these disastrous properties cleaned up. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Bottom? We raised we some a, up for Another snow. individual signed up to speak. Uh, Bill Basket. <coughs> you state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. My name is Bill Basket. I live on the 1300 block of North 3rd Street. I am the chairperson for the Springfield Inner City Older Neighborhoods PAC, ICON. Mayor Langfelder, ladies and gentlemen of the city council, I wish to thank you for allowing me to speak. I am here to express ICON support for Ordinance 2021-390, amending Chapter 170, Section 17.58, pertaining to the registration of vacant buildings from three years to one year. ICON would also like to acknowledge the Bloomberg report compiled and presented to Springfield by Megan Willis Jackson, Harvard Fellow. ICON is pleased to see an ordinance proposal come from this report in Ordinance 2020-390. Although this is a good first step in addressing the Bloomberg report, there is much more hard work which lies ahead for the City of Springfield in dressing blight. ICON and the neighborhood associations affiliated with ICON are more than willing and able in helping Springfield in whatever capacity we can in addressing and fighting blight in the inner city older neighborhoods. <clears throat> ICON has composed the following questions for the mayor and city council, which are as follows. Will properties actively registered under the current ordinance and up to date on paying their registration fees be grandfathered in the three year track until they are either demolished or brought into ordinance compliance with a certificate of occupancy. Is it possible some property owners in a three year program could have a theoretical never end date assuming they can have their deadlines extended through continuances in administrative court? Will there be compliance schedules given to those property owners who say they are making progress and ask for a continuance in administrative court? If there is compliance schedules given to the property owner, how transparent will these compliance schedules be in tracking the property on the city's website? Will those properties which were previously registered under the current three-year ordinance, but the registration has expired, be allowed to re-register under the three-year program or be required to register under one-year ordinance? Mm -hmm. As per the ordinance, paragraph E states, each building that has been registered under this chapter shall be listed on the city's website which listing shall include the address of the building and the name of the record owner of the property on which the building is located. Are the mayor and city council going to allocate the monetary and personnel resources to maintain an up-to-date database in order to comply with section E in the ordinance? Thank you once again for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, 
One thing I would suggest, uh, we'll have a working group with uh, Alderman Gregory and Alderman Donlin. I would suggest that uh, Bill Basket and uh, Cavalaria Realtors be part of that, as well as uh, we'll have someone from Public Works there uh, to represent the administration. So, uh, any other questions or comments? Okay. Very good. So, uh, there's been a motion to hold and a second it. All, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 2021-396, an ordinance approving Million Gooding Cheek to the Civil Service Commission. The chair will entertain a motion. Place agenda number 2021-396 on final passage. So moved. Second. second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? I know uh, Million Gooding Cheek's here. I don't know if you want to come forward and uh, say a few words. Thanks for allowing me to be here this evening. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I've lived most of my adult life in Springfield. I have a bachelor's degree from Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. I did my master's work at University of Illinois in Springfield. I've worked in both the private and public sectors. I currently work for an association on a part-time basis. Um, I have two children, and I look forward to serving on the commission. If anybody has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank Thanks thank for having you. me. Is there a, uh, uh, it's been moved and seconded to, for approval, is that right? Yep. Yes. Very good. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2021-397, an ordinance amending Chapter 90, adding Section 90.15.4 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended, changing from a package-only sale license to an on-site consumption license. Cheryl, entertain a motion to place agenda number 2021-397 on final passage. So moved. Second. Okay, move and second. Um, Cheryl, entertain a motion to amend agenda number 2021-397. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Um, council, if you want to go over the amendment. The, uh, excuse me. Yep. The proposed amendment um, is one that was discussed, if you recall, at the Committee of the Whole. Uh, I did provide uh, copies uh, with a highlighted section that adds uh, subsection 90.15.5 uh, referencing uh, 3 a.m. liquor licenses and sales. This uh, provision provides that no new liquor uh, license shall be granted that allows for the sale of alcoholic drink for consumption on the premises or the sale in the original package for consumption off the premises between the hours of 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. after the effective date of this amendment. It indicates that this shall not apply to the renewal or transfer of existing licenses or to Class K licenses, which are the full-service uh, hotels, right, mini bars, you know, in the rooms. This section does not apply to the extended hours of operation permitted under Section 9030B, which is for, for example, uh, New Year's Eve uh, or the uh, State Fair or Section 90.36.1, which you may recall, uh, there are permits, uh, uh, single permits that allow an individual licensee to stay open later, but with the permission of the alderman. So there are specific, you know, temporary little ones that this would not uh, interfere with. So that's kind of a summary, and I don't know if there are questions, but uh, that reflects the language. Alderman Hanauer? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, the reason why I proposed this last week was uh, when we, we've got a problem with police protection throughout the city from around 2 o'clock in the morning to about 4 o'clock in the morning or later, I guess, if it depends on how, how crazy the crowd is when they leave these 3 o'clock bars. Um, many times we don't have police protection on the in, in most of the wards, except for the ones that have the three o'clock license, um, that's the purpose of, of doing this. The people that have the three o'clock license, they're still going to have it. It's just saying 
we're not going to go forward. Um, we, we allowed the last 3 o'clock license, we allowed, um, quite frankly, I wish I would have had that vote back because I would have voted no after because it's been one of the places that we've had nothing but problems with and it was shut down for, I don't know, over a year. But we were sold a bill of goods on it. And uh, I just, um, I think that this is for, this, uh, and, and, and I know people will say, well, the kids, you know, want to go out, people want to go out, I understand that, but in other municipalities where they have a lot of kids in college towns and that, they shut down a lot of times at one o'clock. I think a lot of them are at one o'clock. So um, that was my purpose on it. Um, um, you know, it, it's strictly, my, my, my purpose on this is strictly for police protection. Also, this kind of activity where they have to go to the three o'clock bars, it, it really tax our police department and, and, you know, I don't know where Kenny or anybody, oh, Kenny's up there, yeah. um, if he wants to come down and talk about what it does, but we've got a police department right now where we're short staffed. We don't have that many police officers out on the, on the street, that, you know, in any given shift and, you know, they have to go, sometimes they have to go in these bars to rouse people out and, or, you know, break up a fight or whatever. And, you know, it puts them in a bad situation. So that that's, I'm not going to dwell on it anymore. If Kenny wants to, if you would allow him to talk about what, you know, from the police department standpoint, I'd appreciate that. May I have a question? Yep. All the purchase. Is that temporary what Alderman Hanauer is talking about with us having a shortage? So it's not like this is going to be forever where we don't have the manpower to go to these establishments, correct? Yeah. Uh, Assistant Chief Scarlett can speak to the staffing level of the police department. Thanks, Mayor, and uh, <clears throat> appreciate the opportunity to come speak. And I would say that, honestly, I feel that it's more about uh, the temporary situation that we're, we're involved in right now with our manpower. Uh, on any giving fr uh, Friday or Saturday night, we would have what was called the, the weekend closing detail, where we have to suck all of our resources from the entire city to various locations where we know we're going to have issues, and that's, that's typically that 2.30 uh, 2 closing time to 3.30, sometimes 4 o'clock. So, uh, yeah. On any given weekend, it's typical to have, I would say, 10 to, to 14 or 15 officers at those locations where we know there are going to be issues uh, because of the, the 3 o'clock uh, closing. So uh, it, is, it is taxing on manpower. It does affect um, our ability to respond to other calls for service. It does affect our proactivity when it comes to patrolling the streets for burglars or whatever the case may be, for sure. Alderman Woman Conley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this, this is a question, I don't know, maybe for the Corporation Council, but do we have existing requirements that bars with a 3 a.m. license provide their own security? Well, they do, they do require their own security. The, uh, in other words, uh, the, the city uh, is not providing you know, individual security for a business. It's only if the incident happens where it might be appropriate because it's criminal, perhaps criminal conduct. But the, you know, individual business uh, is responsible for its own, you know, security inside, for example, inside its uh, facility and things of that nature. But do we require that they have staff do, do we, on do, site? Does the city code, you mean, set yes, out a... that's my, that's okay, my question. require them to hire security? Yes. No. Um, I mean, because I, I will say, I mean, and, and I appreciate... This, the stress that this puts on an understaffed department um, that, from what we've been told, it is going to take a while to get back up to even a reasonable staffing level. Um, my concern is that we shut this door on 3 a.m. licenses, which we haven't given out since I've been on council, haven't seen one. Um, shut that door absent maybe looking for some other obligations that we can connect to these licenses. Um, I mean, I know there have been other incidents um, where we've had off-duty officers providing security at, you know, that's, I mean, I'm not saying that they need to work a second job, but, you know, <laughs> please, I'd like them to get arrested. But, um, you know, I, th I think if we require that these, these later bars 
have their own security that can provide supports that's not just inside the building, but also outside as people are exiting, that might be a more reasonable, you know, stop things before they require a police department. And certainly if it's an opportunity for our off-duty police officers to earn a little extra money, I, I think that would be a fabulous option for them. But I, I think that we could put maybe a little more onus on the people who are making money off of this and want to continue it. And if someone wants to come in with a new license, they should come into compliance with basic safety from an owner's perspective as opposed to the city just saying, no, you can't. So, and I appreciate, again, Alderman Hanover, I appreciate where you're coming with this, this, or, this amendment. Um, but I, I just want to be careful that we don't close too many doors without exploring other options. If you wouldn't mind, I would speak on the off-duty component. So we sure. do allow uh, our officers to work off-duty jobs. They have to file a request to, to work certain jobs, and we, the chief and I approve those. Uh, one thing we do not allow is our officers to work on the interior of bars. We have allowed officers to work parking lots, uh, you know, on the streets associated with uh, bars and that sort of thing. I will tell you this, that uh, there's currently a situation where we have off-duty officers that were in, uh, working security on the outside, involved in an incident, which now they're on duty, so the city owns them, and they're involved in a, in a lawsuit. So those are just some things, uh, a use of force situation. Those, those are just things we have to take into consideration. Other complications. The, the, yes. the issue related yeah. to uh, what the chief is talking about, the assistant chief is talking about, is very serious because if we allow a police officer to go to a place in their uniform carrying their gun or their badge, something happens, that is a liability issue for the city even when they're off duty. And the, the example that's being given, we're involved in federal court right now that's involved a lot of litigation, so that's a reason why the chief, the department takes very serious about what they will allow and not allow an officer to do because the city can, in effect, uh, be liable for that, even though they're working for a private party by virtue of their authority and position. And I, I appreciate that. I guess my bigger point was maybe we need to be looking at putting more obligations on the owners of these, these 3 a.m. bars as opposed to putting all of the weight on, on the shoulders of our police department in terms of even official duties. So um, mm -hmm. just something to kind of consider. I've, mm -hmm. I do think we should keep this door as, open, as an option for, for new businesses as they come in. Yeah, I think on the... Uh the one uh, that had been suspended previously, they do have to have, that's a requirement now going forward that they have to have their own security. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we address it as we need to. But uh, that's something we'll take into consideration. Alderman Donlin and then Alderman Gregory. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Alder, Alderwoman Conley, I think that is a good idea and that's something we should talk about in the future. Um, on the uh, the issue of the, the staffing levels, uh, Chief, uh, how, what's the what's the number of police officers we have sworn officers we have presently? So we're authorized 250. Uh, we have we're approximately I would say about 20 short, so we're around 230. Now keep in mind, uh, 15 of those are currently in the academy, so they do us no good for uh, right. probably another five or six months. They got to get out of the academy, go through training. And you mentioned that it takes 10 officers to deal with present situations. So the 3 a.m. license approximately. It could be a little less, could be a little more, just depends. It depends on um, and and uh, at the high level of the police department, my understanding is that we had 280 officers. Is that right? At one time, yes. Sir. Okay, so we had 280 officers. Uh, I remember vividly back in, during that time that uh, we had the same exact situation where a significant portion of the shift we're going to these establishments and having to deal with the exact same issue it hasn't changed it's been going on for decades i would venture to say uh, throughout my 23 and a half years yes it's right it's and constant. it's even more difficult today because of the staffing situations but it was still difficult under the old situation my point is that we can, even if we went back up to the, the maximum level of our department, it would still be the same issue. Mm -hmm. Now, Alderman Hanauer, I think to your ordinance, or to your amendment, uh, it's fair, because it would not impact existing establishments. It would only uh, bar the 3 a.m. licenses for new establishments. Isn't that correct? <laughs> so anyway, I think the, in my opinion, the safety of the citizens, the resources of the, the police department and the city uh, is more important than other things that have been brought up this evening, with all due respect. Thank you. Alderman Gregory? 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I respect everyone's opinion. I, I think we all have made some valid points. I, I, I more lean on the side of dealing with uh, whatever issue we're happening, uh, having um, at, at a particular moment, um, whether that's uh, a club in my ward or a park in my ward or, or, or whatever. We, we, we have to be innovative and, and, and try to address these things um, and work with um, we worked with the park district before to, to deal with some problems, and you know, um, for the issue that that we've had, you know, we, we need to work with uh, the owner because uh, these owners, you know, that that are that are having these clubs, they don't want this stuff that happens. I, on my way here, there was just a shooting. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so, so violence happens. There's no particular time. It's a little slower at night, so we see a lot more of it and we hear it. But there's violence that happens throughout the city all day long. Uh, a man was just shot and killed on the south side of my ward, 9 o'clock last night. So it, that's why I, I'm really fighting for the resources to really put into um, to help these situations out anywhere from homeless to to um, um, many of the things, underlying issues that we really need to address are we're going to be going through this for the rest of our terms and the next terms. And, and that's what we have to do. And that's how we're going to fix this situation. Not being closing everything down or closing down at 1 o'clock. There is some college um, towns that close at 1 o'clock and the kids hate it. Um, the people in the town hate it. Uh, they want to hang out a little bit longer. We don't have a lot. Um, we've talked about, like I said, casinos and um, different business ventures to try to grow this city, to try to add to our revenue to help get more officers, to help pay for it, firefighters and all the things that we're struggling at right now. And, and, and we just deal with the issue. We just deal with the issue, in my opinion. And, and instead of blanking it at everybody, I hate for everybody to throw everybody in the same bucket. I hate it. I hate to be done, done like that. I'm sure none of us want to be thrown in the one large bucket, um, and, and that's just where I'm standing on this. Alderman Red Path. So when we're talking about private security for uh, these establishments, you got to understand they can handle certain situations. They can't handle the big ones. Our police officers are always going to be there. They're going to have to sit outside and wait till this thing spills into the street, which it will. And then we're gonna. Then it's gonna be a situation where there's police officers tied up at one scene, and they're not out in Ward Six, or not out in Ward Ten, they're not out in Ward One. They're tied up in, the, in a situation where the city's not covered. I live in the biggest geographic ward in the city. The district that I have in my police district go, starts at South Grand, goes to Toronto Road. If you could figure that out, that's a pretty big district, and we have one officer. Okay, that officer, if there's trouble somewhere in the city, so a lot of times has to pull out of there. We have to depend on the county, have to depend on UIS, Lincoln Land, uh, uh, Southern View, and others to help cover us. And am I correct with the the the, the, the when we call other agencies in to help us out? Well, it's 100 percent, and we are innovative, as, as Alderman Gregory says, in our, our response. And if we have to use other agencies, we have a, other resources that obviously don't work. So that's the that's the situation we're in, and it happens on the outskirts of town all over. I, you know what happens out in Ward Six and Ward Seven, and Ward Ten, just like it does in my ward. Now, the bottom line is, is the cities around us have gotten rid of these three o'clock licenses, and they got rid of them because of the problems that they cause. I talked to the police union today; they are in total support of us of this of this ordinance. And we're giving, we're giving the people who have these three o'clock licenses an opportunity to, to, to live up to it. And what that means is take care of your own business and keep things from getting out of control. Private security is good, but it's not going to be enough because when they get in there to a situation where they have two or 300 people show up in your parking lot, uh, we're not going to send our officers into the middle of that situation. We're gonna, that, that, that puts our officers in a bad way. We, we need more officers. We, they know it. The mayor knows it. We all know it. And we got to find the resources to do that. But 3 a.m. licenses, nothing good happens after 1 o'clock. And the revenue that comes in on a 3 o'clock license is, is minimal. It's not going to be enough to, to uh, justify the resources that we have to use. I encourage this council to support this ordinance and this amendment because it, it will be beneficial to the city of Springfield. Thanks. Any other comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Alderman Williams. So I, I support the ordinance, but, but I'm going to vote against the amendment 
I, I see it as a, a form of mass punishment. I know that uh, if three o'clock ever went away, that don't mean people's going to go home at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're going to go somewhere. They're going to do something and because they're, they're young. I mean, because it's a quality life issue for them. They want something to do. They don't want to, part, you know, roll up the sidewalks and everybody go home and go. To, they're not going to do that just because everything's closing at one. Now, I'm glad that we are going to grandfather, if this goes this way, them in, the ones that exist now. But then it's like, uh, for the future of growth, we are a city. All cities experience this kind of stuff. We're not Chatham, we're not Rochester. So sure, the surrounding ones, maybe they shouldn't be open till three. They're not big enough, or maybe because they come all over here. But I just think it's a quality of life issue. I think the market has to dictate a lot of stuff. And if you have a problem, you deal with that problem. You don't pass stuff that affects everybody. That There's three o'clock places. Uh, when's the last time the police went to the Crown Plaza because it was, you know, and they had three o'clock. When's that? So my ward has a mixture, and all I'm saying is all three o'clock bars ain't bad. Deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Deal with the one. First of all, it's only seven, ain't it? Six, seven licenses. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about a whole lot of licenses. So I just don't understand why uh, we think that we have to, to to put an amendment like this onto this bill. That's all I have. Any other questions or comments? We do have two people signed up to speak. First is Mike Monsur, and the next one's Alice Ramey. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Monsur. I'm here on behalf of, of representing the Central Illinois Licensed Beverage Association. Our association represents bars and restaurants in our community here. Um, I'm here because many of them are working right now during the dinner hour and they can't attend these meetings. <laughs> Um, with that said, uh, the mayor had contacted us about the original ordinance and if we could get support for the original ordinance from the association. And we had time to present it to the association. And uh, last week I spoke to you. I was very direct with you, but with the intention of helping you. Um, and the association did support the amendment. Uh, where 10 aldermen offered the amendment, I'm, so, I, I'm sorry, and we weren't able to say yay or nay on that at that time. I want to let you know last night we had our chapter meeting, and it's hard to breathe with this. Uh, at our chapter meeting, we presented the issue to the members that were in attendance. And to me personally, to our surprise, the membership supported the amendment um, for the reasons that uh, Alderman Hanauer, which I have not had the opportunity to speak to about this, uh, present it. Uh, with that said, we also had the same questions that many of you have about the impact and the long-term impact it would have on our city and our community. Uh, not only with tourism, but the quality of life and, and, and for our younger generation. But then we think about our police department and we're strong supporters of our police department and the safety of the community. So our proposal is possibly not go with the amendment this evening, but let's have a discussion. And our association would be willing to sit down and maybe come up with a good solution and not one that has been tagged onto an ordinance that we already agreed to. Um, I think the end result will be what Ward Town and Alderman uh, Hanauer is trying to achieve. And Chuck Redpath, you are absolutely right. You know, we can't have our officers already strapped you know, going to different areas. But uh, if it passes, I think you have the support, but we're asking for that time to discuss it and come up with a solution together. Um, that maybe makes a little more sense. You know, I mean, I, I say that respectfully. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alice Rainey. don't know how to approach this, okay, because I've had three o'clock license. I had an officer at my bar. I work where there were uh, bar people taking care of their license at three o'clock and officers at the door. So it's pretty hard for me to say this, but I don't believe in three o'clock license, never did, but I had one because I lived in the county and I could get them, you know, and 
have fun. I believe that our police officers are short. They don't need to be running and, and handling little fights that the owners can handle themselves. If these owners do not take care of their bar license, they should not have them and they should be revoked. If they can't handle the situation, then get rid of the bar and get rid of the license. I feel that three o'clock license is a detriment to, to this city until such time that they understand what they are. There is very strict. You don't make a lot of money from one to three, maybe about $500 to pay for a couple of beers, okay? That's about it, okay? It don't even help pay for your license you have to pay every year or your insurance that you have to have and the help you have to have. So it's not really economical for them to have it. I don't want to see a police officer get shot in the leg because he was trying to get something taken care of in one of these crazy bars. I don't like that, never have, uh, because my family were in the police department and judges. So you see, I'm kind of partial to those people. Plus, it doesn't give a good name when you have somebody come in here and they want to start a business and already you hear about Dirty South or you hear about some other place that's already had shootings, okay? Uh, we want our city to have peace, be able to make money for our owners, our businesses, our black owner businesses, and the whole 25 yards. If you vote against this, then you have to pay the consequences. That's how it is. And I had to pay it. And it's not fun coming in your pocket and paying out $100,000. It's not fun. And that's for three o'clock license I had. I had a country and western bar. So I think it's time that we all sit back and look at this ordinance and not pin it on something else, make it a separate ordinance. I think it's better that way. And if you, people want to have a party up until three in their little backyard or whatever the case may be, if they have a bar or whatever, then let's make it optional. Can't even talk, optional to that point of the party, and then that's it. Let them pay that $1,500, and that's it. After that time is up, you don't have them anymore. We have to have a separate ordinance on this 3 o'clock license, Mayor, as you know, okay? To hang it on to this, it's not going to work because you already grandfathered the other th uh, six mm -hmm. in, which if you take away these three licenses for the new ones coming in, they're going to say, hey, how come they got there, you know, that's not fair either. You don't need that conversation. So make this a separate entity, the three o'clock license, and make it strong enough and have enough that you can have a party, like the fair. They stay open until three, okay? And they usually handle theirs very well, okay? Sometimes you might have a little fight because Johnny saw his girlfriend do this and whatever, okay? But you have to be able to have a, B, C, D, E in a separate entity. And if I were you, Mayor, i make it a separate entity since you're the people, Thank you. okay? Appreciate it. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Vote, Roll say nay. 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 Roll call. Roll, Roll call. call vote on the amendment. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Nay. Alderman Williams. No. Alderman Phil Genzi. Present. Alderwoman Lakeisha Purchase. Nay. Alderwoman DeCenso. No. Alderman McMiniman. Yes. Alderwoman Connolly. No. Alderman Donnelly. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Four ayes and five nays, Mayor. So the motion fails. Is there a motion on the ordinance? So move. Uh, yeah. Further second. Uh, further, yeah, discussion. second and further discussion. I've got a, an amendment on nothing to do with what we've been talking about tonight, but um, basically <clears throat> the original intent, uh, the original ordinance as drafted says, hey, if you've been a package only and then you want to become consumption, um, you have to state consumption, and you can't do any package. So um, I think that's maybe an overbroad 
um, result because let me give you a couple examples. Um, in uh, we've got corkscrew on Chatham Road. It was package only, and then it became consumption because they want to have tasting parties and that kind of thing. But they never got video gaming. They never got video gaming, uh, or even like Harvest on Chatham on uh, Route Four. I think their package. And they may have begun packaged, but they're definitely a port also now. And they have kind of events where they can port the liquor, but they have no video gaming. And I don't think they ever intend to have video gaming. So I like to see this written so that we can still allow that type of situation. Someone that's packaged and they want to become poor, but they won't ever have video gaming. And so I've got a proposed amendment that basically tries to say that there will be an additional sentence to this amended uh, 90.15.4, and it says basically, um, however, such licensees that have no video gaming are not limited to class A, D, or E licenses if they remain free of video gaming. And uh, I've got that written down here. Um, so basically, it just says, hey, if you're if you're package only now and you want to go do package and consumption, yeah, you can do that, but with the condition that you remain free of video gaming. Alderman Hanner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the, in, in Alderman McMiniman's right. You know, a lot of grocery stores now they start they, they have their package liquor and then they also have a um, well, it, it's like a little restaurant you know where they they sell alcohol and you know and they don't have gaming I mean the purpose of this is to stop the game and I don't know if the, if I, I guess I'd leave it up to um, um, you know corporate corporation council but if if that if that amendment does it that that's great because we we are going to have somebody else that comes in here at some point in time that's going to want to open up a store you know, uh, like Harvest Market or, or wherever, um, and uh, that's they're going. That's going to be a big part of it. And so, does I guess my big question is: Does this prevent that from happening in the future? Well, the, the the stores you're talking about will have really two licenses, or sometimes three. So the package. Uh, liquor area, you know, if you look at most of the grocery stores, are actually in a separate area of the store. So they have a separate package license. They then will apply for a restaurant license. So you may have an entity only having more than one license. And so the circumstance that this is describing really is not that situation because anyone is free to apply for more than one license, you know, in a separated uh, 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 license premises. And you typically see that with uh, uh, large stores. Uh, Harvest Marketing is a very good example. I think hy V, if my memory serves me, has a packaged liquor area that's at the north end of the store. Then at the south end, they have, I think, something they call the grill. Well, those are licensed, for example, as a restaurant or as a bar separately. So each license has its own, its own restrictions. So under the gaming law, I think where some of the confusion is, remember the city does not uh, say uh, really per se who can get uh, or establish the gaming. It's really the State Gaming Commission. And the state law says that if you are package liquor, you may not have a gaming license. You may not have it. So, um, but a gaming uh, or I'm sorry, a packaged liquor store could certainly decide I would like to change from a packaged liquor and become a tavern or a restaurant. See what I mean? In other words, they would just go and apply for a different license. And so the uh, circumstance here is where there appears to be almost a hybrid model developing where you might have a uh, packaged liquor that wants a small poor area in order to get gaming even though their principal business is still packaged liquor. That's hard and so that's the, it's really not the grocery store issues or things like that. So the uh, uh, direction uh, from the mayor was to try to address that specific uh, uh, situation where you would have a packaged liquor only, not a grocery store, packaged liquor that wanted to uh, convert which they certainly are allowed to convert, but they just have to make a choice. Do they want to become a 
for example, a tavern? Do they want to come a restaurant? Do they want to come A, D, and E are either restaurant or tavern licenses, but you couldn't continue to sell package. Now, there is a license called a double A that allows a tavern that can do a package of liquor, but there are very few of those, and they mostly have been kind of neighborhood uh, type taverns or things of that nature. So I don't know if that helps or not, but the intent was it would, this would not affect, for example, a grocery store or a harvest market. But the double A could, they could go for the double A and it'd do the same thing as what we're trying to prevent. Well, except that they're, they're limited to an A, a D, or an E. If they convert, they're limited to an A, D, or E. So that would preclude the packaged liquor. But double A can go for a video gaming, yeah. can't they? Yeah, double A or or an A or a D or an E can as well. So, Mayor. I'm sorry. Yeah. Alderman Hanauer, uh, then Alderman Rebecca. I Rep apologize for, for drawing this out. But, That's right. Okay, so uh, I, I want to have a liquor store, but I want to make sure I got gaming. You know, basically what we're, what we're dealing with. Uh, let's say the um, liquor store out in Toronto Road. So instead of doing a liquor store, what they do is they put in a little bar, and then they say, oh, yeah, we're going to get the double A. We're going to sell packaged liquor, too. And then they have a big packaged liquor store, <laughs> but they had, and they got a double A license. They apply for the, the um, they apply for gaming, and they've got it. There's nothing we can do about it. But the, and that's what this amendment addresses. That would keep that from happening. How? How, how could it? Because, because they're only, if I say I'm going to have a tavern, because it's limited to a class A, D, or E. If they make that conversion, they cannot apply for a double A. But I'm talking about new. Any new per any new that's what they're gonna do. Think about that. So there wouldn't be a conversion, it should you're just saying a new entity. Yeah, that'd be, yeah a new entity. Well the other option is uh, not giving out any more double A's. How many we do we can find out how many Bars sell packaged liquor. I'm not You're sure. You're the liquor commissioner. Many. You can say no. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, well, supposedly. Alderman <laughs> Repath. <laughs> did, did you have something else, Alderman Repath? <laughs> said, You're the liquor commissioner. You can say no to double A's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there a motion on the amendment? Or three AMs? Well, on Joe, yep. you're talking about. Right. I, I think the amendment is harmless, and uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with the, um, the, the with the corkscrew analysis where they started out with a package only, and then I think this ordinance that's introduced could prevent corkscrew from becoming package and consumption. Well, but. Uh, uh, just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not specifically aware of the corkscrew situation, but a packaged liquor can have tasting. Uh, you see that all the time where they'll have wine or something. They're just not selling it. It's like they're allowing you know, people to have samples and things of that nature. So they do have the ability of a packaged liquor can uh, have a situation where on a Saturday or a Friday or whatever they pick to do, they might uh, be able to open wine bottles or give tasting uh, uh, like a tasting area, but they're not really uh, acting per se as a as a tavern where they're selling by the by the glass. Okay, with that explanation, let's go forward uh, with a vote on the ordinance as it presently stands. And if Todd Oliver gets back with us and says we got a problem, we can address it later. Sure. Call so any questions. other discussion on the ordinance? Thank you. All questions. those in favor, motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes six voting yes. There are seven voting yes, two voting no, and one voting present. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 2021-399, an ordinance authorizing additional funding in an amount not to exceed $143,000 under contract number UW21-11-50, powdered activated carbon with Carb Pure Technologies, LLC, for a total amount not to exceed $309,000 for the Office of Public Utilities for emergency passage. Children will obtain a motion. Place uh, agenda number 2021-359 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? 
All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes uh, 11 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2021-406, an ordinance authorizing acceptance and execution of grant number 22-751029 from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity under the Local Tourism and Convention Bureau grant program in the amount of $514,919 with matching funds required in the amount of $128,747.50 beginning July 1st, 2021 through June 30th and a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $514,990 for the Springfield Convention Visitors Bureau for Emergency Passage. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2021-406 on final passage. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no, and one voting present. Chair will entertain a motion to spend with the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2021-419, an ordinance approving the appointment of Justine Macklin to the Civil Service Commission. So moved. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to spend with the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2021-420, an ordinance authorizing the execution of an agreement between the City of Springfield and GR Consulting LLC for professional lobbying in an amount not to exceed $75,000 for the office of the mayor. So moved. Second. Second. So moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Is there any unfinished business come before the council? Mayor. Yes, Alderman Hanauer. Uh, real quick, um, I had a uh, constituent contact me. I guess I'm calling it old business because this happened way back when 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 we did this. But uh, he had business at downtown. He pulled into the municipal lot, you know, across the street. Um, there's no signage on how much it cost. Um, so there's a sign that says go to the desk at the Hilton. I think it's a Hilton or Wyndham, wherever, whatever it is this week, and uh, the hotel there. And uh, he, so he went, and he said, "I'm going to be. I've got an hour meeting, and I'm going to. I'll be out." And they said, "Well, it's eleven dollars." And um, I remember. I mean, I know we. The the hotel now operates that, correct? Do they or do we lease it to them, or what? How, how's that whole whole thing go? And I guess my concern is they they need to put a sign up that that, that gives their 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 rates so that people that don't want to go in there they can they can go somewhere else. Um, and I just think and I've I've actually had a couple people call me about this. Um, and I told this one gentleman I bring it up tonight because that, that's just not right. Yeah, we can uh, talk. Uh after the meeting and uh, check that out. But uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be talking to the owner later tonight because they just opened up the Starbucks. So I'll uh, converse with him about that. Okay. Alderman Gregory. Good mayor, I have to ask you, uh, <laughs> where's the, uh, where's the weed for money? The business, the business, the cannabis business. I, I, I'm getting talked to, I'm messing with Joe with that. But where, what are we doing with that cannabis business program? We need to get it out. And um, I've, I've had a thousand questions about it. And, you know, I, I have no explanation. Yeah, the uh, money's still there with regards to that, but the uh, with regards to the program, we can meet on it uh, this week. Uh, actually, Robbie and the Messman did come up with the parameters, so okay. we'll uh, discuss it and then hopefully finalize it next week. Okay, thank you, sir. And just my final question, I'll be able to make myself some notes. Um, this will probably be directed to Budget Director McCarty, but have we um, got the new numbers from the Out West Dispensary yet? Like we did with the last two, I know we had to get a privacy letter. Well, the the dollars are coming in, yes, sir. but I don't have the the letter okay. that would allow us to disclose those numbers publicly, like we have for the downtown location. Okay. Any any um, time frame that you're looking to get that, or are they 
less That's than actually a question about. for, I think, the Mayor and Corporation Council. They were the ones who got the last letter, okay. and so I think uh, I'm not sure if they've had any success it. with that yet or not. Yeah, we'll try to uh, get in touch with the owner and Thanks, see what I we can do. It. Alderman, or I'm sorry, uh, City Clerk Lesko and then Alderman Donnelly. Uh, Mayor, I wanted to let everyone know that the clerk's office did print out the audit from this morning, or that you had earlier in this uh, at council meeting. It's a rather large file, so if any of the aldermen or the public want to review it without having to print it out, it is available in the clerk's office for review. The hard copy is. The hard copy. Any other uh, unfinished business? Um, one item is uh, we are progressing with the uh, firehouse uh, property location search, so hopefully we'll have a update for everybody in about 30 days. Alderwoman Connolly and then Alderwoman DeCenzo. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was actually gonna ask what, what's going on with the um, the review report that we were, that you were you commissioned for the fire department. Oh, yep. Uh, Is that going to be available can give sometime an update soon? On that. He's getting his steps in tonight. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> just sit right here until this part's done. Uh, Alderwoman, it, uh, I did reach out to the consultants a couple of weeks ago per the mayor's request to get a status update, and they had indicated that they were trying to finalize the report. They thought it would take two to three weeks to do so, so... Theoretically, we should have it any day now. I'll reach out to them again tomorrow to see if we can get another update, and I'll let everybody know. Appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. All the women to send up. Yes. Um, we had another crash. This isn't for you, Director. Not for me? No. Um, <laughs> Stay right here, everybody. Would you better hang around? <laughs> we, we had another crash at a uh, Fayette and MacArthur mm. over the weekend. Um, I don't know how many times I have to bring this up but that area is extremely dangerous. And I've, I've harped on it several times up here and I don't see any effort from either the park district or the city to rectify that situation. You know, other cities can figure out a pedestrian crosswalk. It's not that difficult. I don't know why we can't do something in that area. It's extremely frustrating. I get dozens of calls a week about just that area because the park is so used. Um, you know, I live right in that area. Joe has the west side of that area, and he probably hears the complaints as well. So something's got to be done once and for all. This is, I'm tired of talking about it, I'm tired of hearing about it, and I'm tired of putting the residents in danger. We were looking at um, possibly our next application for the safety improvements for the entire corridor right through there. We obviously did just um, apply for the HSIP funds and receive them for MacArthur and Lawrence, but um, that's, that's another area we are, we're evaluating and we, we can maybe look at doing something interim as well. I mean, have we worked with the park district at all? Have we approached them to do anything? We talked with the park district. We did put in the um, the, the crossing a little bit further on the south side, but um, we'll, we'll reach back out to them as well, see if they're interested in partnering too. Thank you. We can add flashing lights or do something of that nature and try something else, because I know we tried the mini sign and the road didn't work, but no, uh, we'll take a look at it, some other signage, because uh, with regards to the road structure, that'll, well, it's like walnut. I mean, that took a while to that road diet put in so yeah and we looked at possibly reducing it down however due to the ADT and everything along those lines with South Grand as well as um, Lawrence Avenue being so close I don't know if that'll work and you may have some merging and weaving issues so uh, but our traffic engineer is going out there every couple of days to see if there's something we can do and, I'm and just asking for a safe safe way to cross into the park yeah. across MacArthur you know I, I now have a, a teenage son who goes to the park all the time um, and every time I'm like be careful crossing MacArthur so even a 13 year old brain says I'll go to the light right so he'll go down to South Grand and wait for the light as opposed to trying to get through on Williams and that's just right. it's just not acceptable mr. mayor yep Alderman McMinimum then Alderman Donnelly director I guess roughly five or six years ago when we were trying to address this issue, the original proposal was to put the walkway 
in the middle of the boulevard, not at the south end, but in the middle because it's wider there and it could accommodate an island. Um, we did attempt the island at the south end of that uh, crossway of Williams Boulevard and MacArthur Boulevard, um, and that um, island um, indicator that it's a crossway got hit and disappeared real quick. So think about whether the, the middle point of that intersection where it's wider could accommodate an island to um, even a flashing indicator, it's a pedestrian crosswalk to um, slow down the traffic and give more protection to the pedestrians trying to cross there and think about that, whether we want to try that approach again as opposed to at the southern end where it's narrower from curb to curb, it's narrower at the south end from curb to curb, whereas um, towards the middle of that, uh, that's a boulevard intersection, so there's two parallel roads, and uh, the, the middle point of the east-west parallel roads might accommodate something safer. That's one thing we're looking at. We can't put a median in the middle, obviously. Those, those lanes are already so narrow um, at this time, but uh, that, that is one thing that we're looking at at this time for an inner solution. Yeah, if not a curb uh, island, at least a, uh, a sign, a stationary sign that's planted into the, into the roadway. Alderman Donlin. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I, I wasn't going to talk about this topic, but I appreciate you bringing it up, Alderwoman DeCenzo, uh, having been have driving in that area all the time. But I see in other states, uh, in particular, uh, uh, Florida, we used to go to Florida back when we used to go places. But anyway, uh, they have these, you know, crossings that say it's the law, and you've, you've seen these, Nate, and, and they have, uh, you know, the, when the, someone pushes the button, they blink, something like that. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you're considering, but... Anyway, uh, the, the question I have is a completely different topic. Uh, if we have an idea for, because some of the firehouse locations that have been mentioned as far as uh, re, you know, reconfiguring where they are and, and, and the layouts and so forth, if we have an idea of uh, potential locations, Mayor, do we get that to you or the chief, or what do you prefer since there's a consultant involved? Yeah, you can uh, get the location of the chief. What we have him do is run the, well, he can come up and explain it. Well, that, that's, oh, yeah, that's runs good enough the for me. Uh, calls of service, and it uh, creates a mapping <laughs> of uh, nodes, and then uh, making sure there's uh, determining what the response time is for EMS calls and fire calls. Chief, what, just be, just what I'm really getting at is before a report is presented, and we've quote you know kind of headed down a path, at least like to have that conversation with you. According to the mayor, it needs to be with you. So happy well, happy to have that. Yeah, uh, what we'll do is uh, what we've done already is looked at in multi multiple uh, locations and uh, what we can do is run statistics GIS wise as far as where within our four minute response time we can get from each one of those locations and then try and plot the best place to make sure that we have coverage, especially, you know, in the areas that we've talked about. Uh, before, but uh, most of it is just utilizing GIS data and how fast that we can get places. We've looked at probably a dozen or more places, uh, and we've come up with with some that we like right now. But uh, as the mayor spoke about, he, there, we'd like to make sure that we get those in a little bit more information on them and get those in place before we. Thank you, Chief. Up. And then while you are up there, kind of really a most well, fire department related. Um, how are you on, because we talk about it every budget year, as far as starting a new class, that period, hi, new hires, where is that? Uh, we've, I've had some discussions with the mayor's office about that. Obviously, uh, that's going to be a decision that, that comes from the mayor's office. Uh, we're currently understaffed. Um, it's affecting our overtime. Uh, I know that there's you know, a desire to wait and see how the, the both the negotiations and the uh, the report that comes back from the consultants goes. Um, generally, though, the, one of the issues is, is that it takes about 16 weeks to get all of the background checks done, all of the preliminary information before we can actually offer uh, the job to the people who are currently on the list. And then it'll take another six months after that to get them trained and in place. So you're talking about something that's going to take about 10 months from start to finish. So even if wow. even if the mayor came to me tomorrow and said, let's start a class, we would not have those people probably in place until next July, which means that they're going to give us no relief on you know what we're currently experiencing over time during that. 
particular well, period. The, the reason I bring it up is, you know, as I'm sure with other people on the council, people contact you out of the blue, and, and I heard that there was a block of individuals hired years ago, and that, are you in that block? <laughs> And it was a, it was a big number, and there's a potential for a lot of a lot of uh, retiree retirements, and like you said, 10 months to, to hire people that's a concern. So. Right. We had uh, 30 in my class, which was the biggest that was ever hired, and then subsequently, within another 18 months, they hired another 30. So we have 60 oh, wow. people that are going to be eligible for retirement uh, within probably the next 18 months. Now, that's not saying that they're age eligible. That's saying that they will have 20 years on. That's not saying that all of them are going to go at once. Um, but it is going to say that, that those people, more people will have the availability uh, to retire from the job. And, and like I said, it does take a while to fill those in, in your experience, do you, when the eligibility window is open, is it, 100% is never an answer, but is it typically taken? Generally not, actually. Not. Um, I mean, most people are hired, uh, I would say the average person is hired around 27. Uh, we're, are, we're currently the people who will be eligible to retire uh, are still tier one people, so they can retire after 20 years of service, so, so, but we can't retire until we're at least 50. So you still don't have the age to retire for the average person. Generally, the average person puts in between 23 and 27 years of service. So that window will be wide, but it will, but because there's so many people, it will, that we've already seen from my class, um, I think five people out of the 30. So, I mean, you're talking about, you know, a, a decent chunk. And then over the next few years, we expect there to be accelerated numbers of people. Retiring. Well, Chief, I'm not going to drag this out anymore, though. But if you could, if you could take a look at the, the ages and all the, I'm sure you have, and just don't, you didn't know I was going to ask did, this question. No, but, I, I, but if you could look, take a look at that and, and just kind of give us an update. And then if we could have a feel, Mayor, for when, the, when you're going to start the hiring process, I to understand that it takes 10 months. That would be great to have that update. What I'll do is I'll compile the, the number of people total that we have, which is right yeah. just over 200 right now, and tell you the, the number that are eligible to retire. And, and, and thank you for that regular report that we get regarding the overtime. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. so. Although we'll make Conley. Uh, thank you. Um, and actually, Chief, you actually answered most of what I was going to ask you, um, except just real quick to clarify, anyone you hire right now is a Tier 2 pension, right? So we're looking at a statistically fairly big chunk of our Tier 1 um, staff at the fire department leaving within the next possibly 18 months to two years. Mm -hmm. I would be very concerned if we see our, our staffing drop any lower than it's been. Obviously, I forwarded you and the rest of the council and the mayor an email from a constituent of mine who had you know, fairly traumatic fire at, at her home um, and just her extreme appreciation we talked to about for the professionalism, for the, the prompt response time, the professionalism, not just from the staff that showed up the night of the fire, but the people who followed up afterwards, too. So, again, I'd just like to publicly commend, commend them. Um, I would be very concerned, though. I mean, your, your reports, I appreciate getting that regular information. It is a little scary to see what kind of overtime we're looking at. Um, and that, that's, that's not including any potential injuries that may happen, anyone who may get called up for military duty. None of that's factored in. So I'd certainly hope that we're not waiting too long considering starting a class is still a 10 months to any sort of relief for our staffing numbers. Um, but then also, I just want to add, since Station 8 is one of the unit, the houses that is, we're talking about, I'd certainly like to be involved, if I could, with um, if you meet with Alderman Donnell and um, looking at locations. I, I think we probably have a similar one in mind, but I, yeah. I want to make sure because there are a couple of spots that have been talked about and just kind of, just from some of the feedback I'm getting from people in my ward on, on sure. where they'd yeah, like to see. Yeah, forward those to me and we'll be happy to. I, I, I would be surprised, quite frankly, that you're going to give us something we haven't already looked at. Right. Because there's really not a lot of areas that will accommodate what type of land needs that we need to build a fire station. But, I, you know, if, if you're thinking the same thing that we've already looked at, that's a good thing. That means that everybody's on the same page. So. I hope so. That'd be nice. <laughs> First time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for the chief? Thanks, chief. 
Is there any uh, new business coming before the council? Mayor. Alderwoman Purchase. I would just like to thank um, Director Brown for, I requested a tour at CWLP and the tour was very informative to see that we were going from eight filters to 12 and all the measures that's being put in place for us to make sure that we're resolving the issues with our water tasting and the smells was very informative. Great. Yeah, if any uh, council members want a similar tour, just reach out to Doug Brown. Uh, the budget kickoff internally will be October 12th, and uh, so that's for the next fiscal year. So those discussions will happen internally at that point in time. And then, as I mentioned, the Starbucks downtown at the Wyndham opened up. Uh, they had a ribbon cutting today, so uh, they expanded their space, and it's good to see uh, that expansion in downtown Springfield. Appreciate Kayla Gravens, uh, Executive Director for DSI, being here, too. We do have uh, some individuals signed up to speak uh, from Horace Mann. We have, uh, I don't have a last name, unfortunately, Peter, regarding deferred comp. If you'd state your name for the council, we'd appreciate it. Good evening. I'm Peter Moore, and I defer my time to, uh, to Don here. I'll let him speak. Great. Good evening, <clears throat> uh, Mayor Langfelder mm -hmm. and City Council members. My name is Don Carley. I'm a resident of Springfield and serve as the General Counsel of Horace Mann. I'm here tonight as an executive of the company to express our disappointment and concerns related to the City of Springfield's 457B Deferred Compensation Plan uh, and record keeping services. For the record, this relates to RFP number CS2112. The fundamental purpose of this RFP, RFP was to select a single company to provide investment and record keeping services to the City of Springfield employees. The plan allows employees to put away some of their retirement funds uh, into a retirement account. Horace Mann is currently one of a handful of companies that are providing these services. Although Horace Mann has yet to receive an official notice from the city regarding the status of our RFP, we were provided with an email that was sent out on September 14th advising us that the Deferred Compensation Committee had voted to select three companies to participate in the plan going forward. In short, the email stated that Horace Mann will be excluded from the city's plan once the committee's recommendations are ratified by the city of uh, Springfield City Council. I wanted to talk with you about that tonight. Horace Mann uh, provides exceptional retirement uh, products and personalized services. Although the company offers a variety of products and services, no company has the availability or resources to support members of the city's deferred compensation plan as effectively as Horace Mann. We have tremendous financial strength with over 12 billion in assets, and the company is committed to providing plan participants who are our Springfield friends and neighbors uh, with the full resources of the company. We are excited to have the opportunity to support the local community and to ensure eligible city employees can deserve a well-deserved well entire retirement. Importantly, Horace Mann currently provides retirement services to over 4,500 public retirement plans around the country. So we have significant experience. Horace Mann respects uh, customer's choice, um, but in light of the Deferred Compensation Committee decision to select um, multiple providers of the plan, Horace Mann uh, believes that the company uh, is qualified to provide services and would ask that we be given an opportunity to compete uh, while every company's uh, products and services have strengths and weaknesses, we firmly believe that Horace Mann's product suite and services offers are the best in class. I want to stress that Horace Mann is the only uh, local company being considered. Horace Mann was founded here in Springfield 75 years ago. We have approximately 1,000 employees based here 
in Springfield, which is our home office. Our commitment to this community uh, is longstanding and significant. Um, our headquarters is, consists of 200,000 square feet and was constructed 50 years ago. Our commitment is reflected in the support we demonstrate through our senior leaders who support the community in serving local charitable organizations and boards, as well as making significant uh, charitable contributions to local organizations on both an individual and corporate basis. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know, Horace Mann's a publicly traded insurance and financial services company with more than 12 billion in assets. The company um, has a long-standing history in the retirement space, which date back to 1961. Uh, we believe we have a unique opportunity and ability to provide retirement planning services to the members of the city. No other company can compete with the level of personalized service that Horace Mann can provide. And no other company has made the level of commitment to support the city of Springfield over the past 75 years. Uh, respectfully, I would ask uh, the city council when this matter comes up uh, to your attention to review the recommendations carefully and consider whether those recommendations to exclude Horace Mann uh, from this plan is the best choice for the city and the members of the plan. I would like to thank everyone for your attention. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yep. Alderman McMinimum. You know, thank you, Mr. Hurley, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm not sure if any of us know what this is about that are sitting here as aldermen and okay. alderwomen, um, but I do know that uh, a year or two ago there was an attempt to consolidate the IRC deferred comp 457 multiple plans that we have now down to one, and this council kind of rejected that approach. I think the mayor did too. It kind of happened without um, the knowledge of some people who should know about it. So have you, I don't understand how Horst Mann has been excluded from the process at this point in time. I didn't quite understand no, how that happened. Thank you for your question, if I, if I may. Um, I may bring one of my colleagues up if needed, but to, to answer that question directly, um, probably 16, 17 months ago, I think it was on July 23rd, we submitted an RFP. We have not officially heard any response. A letter, uh, an email was sent out um, to a large member, a large number of the plan participants, and it was dated September 14th. That um, email advised those participants that the Deferred Compensation Committee had made a decision to select three of the five participants and advised the participants that uh, they could no longer provide, uh, submit funds to Horace Mann and that Horace Mann would be excluded. So is Horace Mann now one of five that are participating? Yes, sir. And the Workers' Comp Committee has tried to sh uh, reduce that to just three participants. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Odd, I, it seems I, to me. Mr. Uh, yes. I, I think the goal was to provide it to a single provider, and that's certainly a, a, um, something that Horace Mann respects. Um, my understanding is the committee's recommendations are to lure to three. Um, and and our, our view is if we're going to limit it to three and not go to a sole provider, we would ask uh, the city council to reject that recommendation and ensure any qualified company has the right to compete and serve its customers. Yeah, I think three years ago, although we recognize that there's some economies of scale by having one provider, the issue was people have existing relationships with their financial advisors that they like to deal with, and we didn't want to disrupt those personal relationships, those professional relationships with the uh, existing financial providers. And I think that rationale still exists, um, that, that we don't want to force our employees to terminate relationships that they've had for maybe many years. Yeah, a matter of, uh, you know, I'm a, the general counsel for Horace Mann, as a matter of process, it's been unclear to me. Um, we, we do procurement at Horace Mann and we submit, we have 4,500 plans around the country. This process has, has been unique uh, from our perspective, just we haven't heard anything officially 
but emails are going out to the plan participants articulating what the decisions have been made. And my understanding is those recommendations have not come to this council. And, and the city council would be the ones that would ratify it. So we wanted to come here tonight to make sure we could shine some light on this issue and make sure the city council is aware of it. Um, we're quite concerned um, about being excluded. I brought uh, one of our agents, Katie, and a vice president of our life and retirement. Um, we have, you know, a thousand employees that stand ready to serve this community. We want to make sure we have the ability to compete um, and not be excluded from the plan. Yeah. Were you interviewed? I mean, was Horace Mann interviewed in the process, in the RFP process? Um, we submitted the RFP. I know there were some follow-up questions. Um, uh, I, I'm not aware that we were part no of a face-to-face -face interview. interview. If, if I may, uh, Peter Moore okay. is our, our vice president uh, in the retirement space and has more details. Uh, as to an interview, there had not been any notice of finalist or semi-finalist. That's sometimes referred to as an interview. Right. Right. And that had not occurred. Um, yeah. There was some continued... Uh, continued uh, responses up through, I believe, uh, early March, end of February, and subsequently then, as uh, Mr. Carley uh, indicated, we were, some of our participants were informed that we were no longer going to be a provider to them. Right. Alderwoman Conley, then Alderman Hanauer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I guess what you said just kind of crystallizes my question. You're saying employees have been notified and, and, are, and are coming to you and saying that you're not going to be my provider anymore? That is our understanding, yes. Yeah. Okay, that, that seems problematic at best. Yeah, we, we received a copy of, it, of an email that was dated September 14th that some of our customers and friends in the community sent to us, and it was sent out. It was sent to a BCC, so I, we don't know how many people got right. it, but a handful of individuals reached out to us to let them know they had gotten it, and it essentially articulated you know, the deliberations and the decision of the committee and said that, you know, when it's ratified by the city council, you'll no longer be able to invest. And obviously that's raised a lot of customer concerns. At Horace Mann, it's raised concerns it's just about the, the process in general. It seems like that email was sent ahead of coming before this body. And I'm, I'm sure you would have had, you know, a thoughtful discussion and comments. Um, from our perspective, you were deprived that opportunity, but it's already been sent out and created some challenges for us as a company. Yeah, it's I a little imagine. premature. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been part of a lot of RFPs. Um, uh, there should be score sheets that we should be able to look at. Um, I, I assume that because they were a local uh, employee, they should they would get uh, what is it five points or whatever whatever we we do with that. Um, I think it would be be good to you know let them see the score sheets. I don't know, something's out of whack. I would think whether it's fees or whatever. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know anything about how they what their point systems were. Um, but I think that they should they should be able to see the score sheets and see where where they're out of you know what what knocked them out. But uh, you know I hate <clears throat> you know. Anytime we have a local business that gets knocked out of out of this, and especially with Horse Man, I was notified by one of your employees a couple of weeks ago, and I'm, you know, we're, we're not involved in all that, so right. I was shocked when he told me. So, um, but I think we need to see the score sheets. If, if you would indulge me for a, for a moment, I, I, there is a score sheet, and we have that similar process. I think the, the alderman made a comment that's important. You know, your relationship with your financial advisor, think of somebody that's, as the chief just talked about, nearing retirement, thinking about uh, their plans and that personal relationship that they have with the planner is an important one. Um, Horace Mann, obviously, our model is to have a very, you know, one-on-one -on -one relationship. It's not a call center environment or over an email. Um, so even when you think about cost, although our cost is competitive, we're not the low-cost provider. Uh, that's not our goal. Our goal is to provide that human interaction, which we think has value. And for those customers that want somebody to answer their phone, uh, we're there for them. Um, uh, we certainly, as a company, would have respected the city moving to a sole provider. Um, but here, we're 
uh, at least the committee has indicated that they've selected three. Um, I can assure this committee that our, you know, uh, our products and pricing is competitive with uh, that group. Alderman Desenzo, then Alderman Downland. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just for your awareness, we're not involved with the RFP process at all. Um, actually, I was involved with the RFP process for the first time in my four years sitting on this council just in this past week. So just, just so you know, all we get is an ordinance that comes before us on what was chosen. We don't have any involvement in writing the RFP, distributing the RFP, grading the RFP. That's not our function. So j just so you're aware of that, this is not a council issue. No, no, I, I'm aware that you're not involved in the process, but right. I wanted to, uh, and our company wanted to come before you to let you know, because that will be presented to you. It's already been sent out to the community um, before it came to you. But we wanted to come here today so that when you do sue it, you have some context and understand our concerns. Alderman Donlin. Thanks, Mayor. Just a comment. My understanding is the deferred comp program that we have presently in place, the city, meaning the municipality, contributes zero towards that program. It is entirely a decision of each of the employees. Therefore, to Alderman McMinnon's comments earlier, uh, I don't know why the individuals wouldn't have the ability to choose who their provider is, not unlike if they choose what bank their paycheck goes to. Just a comment. Yeah, that's a, uh, the committee was uh, restructured. I mean, the first uh, go around, it was restructured to have union representation of employees and um, other employees. And then, uh, of course, uh, Director McCarty and Director Cousin were on there. The committee, um, you know, vetted or did the RFP, so it's not really the uh, cities, it's the employees. And so uh, I did raise the points of concern uh, with Director uh, McCarty and uh, Cousin earlier this week with regards to the results, because if you wanted to do one provider, go with one provider. And then so the other two selected, I think one was what IPPFA, not a shock there, and then the other one was AXA. So uh, that's what we'll have to, I asked Corporation Council just now, comes to the council, we reject it, does it go back to the original way it was? And so, uh, uh, you know, I, can't, I come from banking, you know, so I'm familiar with uh, this type of process. Uh, with regards to that, you know, if a provider wants to, um, you know, save the employees money with basis points, and that's the reason we move this direction, then cut your basis points and everybody will come your direction. And then you'd have the service that you want or whatever. And uh, so, you know, um, I know my opinion would be just go back to the drawing board just because of the way it was, and it just, uh, but I'll leave that up to the committee. Uh, Corporation Council will check if the council rejects it. Does it go back to square one, or uh, do we pretty much don't have a say so? So that's what we'll have to check. Mr. Mayor, uh, real oh, briefly, McMinimum. if going from five providers down to three providers requires city council action, and I am assuming it does. I think so, yeah. Then what are these emails going out there saying that we're going in a certain direction? Someone's jumped the gun here. Um, and if you can show us how that happened, uh, let us know, because this council has the final decision, and we don't want uh, incorrect information going out there by a decision that has not yet been made. Right. Alderman, you're correct. I just want to clarify for the record that that notice did not go out from the city or any city officials or human resources. It actually was the union representatives on the committee that sent that out to their members alerting them to the decision that the committee had made and was forwarding on to uh, Corporation Council's office to come before the council for approval. So I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Well, check on that email, because if it says, if it doesn't say something like subject to city council approval, it, it's, there's a problem with that email that that member yeah. of the committee is on, and that member of the committee ought to receive some, uh, um, <laughs> Sanctions? You want, you want some corrective <laughs> right. um, guidance. Well, there are four. Yeah. The, there are four union members, representatives on the committee. And my understanding, I haven't seen the email, is that it was a unified email that went out from from all of them to the union folks. I haven't seen it. I'm not in a union, so I I, I don't know. But that's what happened. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Alderman Conley. Thank you. I was hoping Director McCarty would state this. We did get an email from him around 4.30 this afternoon, um, kind of going over a little more detail of this. And I apologize. I was off work and then 
coming here, so I didn't see that. Um, I, I will say, and I, I do, I, I agree, um, Alderman McMenamin, members of the committee should not be putting news out like that ahead of council action. Um, as a union person, <laughs> as a union member, I do expect my union to keep me informed about changes that are going to impact me. And, and I will say the people I've heard from are only people who, um, who have their phones with you and who were, to be quite honest, upset about losing Horace Mann as an option. So, um, you know, I appreciate, I appreciate that, that that sometimes is, is what they, is what a union will do is give their, give their people a heads up. This is the direction things are going in. So, um, Anyway, thank, thank you for coming in tonight um, and giving a little more clarity to your position. I'm certainly going to look a little more closely at this as it, as it moves forward, but I appreciate you having the heads up to come in and talk to us also. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on that point? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Harvey Hall. Not on my... He couldn't Harvey. make it. Okay. Uh, Bill Basket. My name is Bill Basket. I live on North 3rd Street. I am the president of the Lincoln Park Neighborhood Association. Mayor Langfelder, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, I wish to thank you for allowing me to speak. I am here to speak and express my concern about the pop-up parties which have been occurring over the past several years in the inner city older neighborhoods. And more recently, the pop-up party which occurred on the four corners of North Grand Avenue and Fifth Street to include the parking lot of Quick and Easy this Sunday morning, October 2nd. This is not the first time a Springfield citizen has expressed their concern to the mayor and the city council in regards to pop-up parties in the older neighborhoods. This is not the first time a pop-up party has occurred at the four corners of this location this year. There was a pop-up party which occurred on July 3rd, 2021, in which the Quick and Easy sustained a significant amount of damage to the inside of the store because of individuals at this pop-up party. There was a pop-up party on September 13th and 20th, 2020, at the same corners of 5th and North Grand. The incident on the 20th of 2020, the quick and easy was forced to shut down. On one of these occasions, I cannot remember exactly when, because there have been so many of these parties at this location, that state police in the Sangamon County Sheriff's Office was on the scene in which they had to ask, which they had asked Springfield Police if they needed assistance in maintaining order and this help was turned down. There was also a pop-up party which occurred this summer in the parking lot where the Shop and Save used to be on North Grand Avenue. It was at this party where gunshots were fired and someone was shot. Springfield has contingency plans for natural disasters, chemical spills, and mob action. The Springfield Police Department does not have a contingency plan in place to address the pop-up parties which have been occurring over the last several years in the inner city older neighborhoods. This is evident by eyewitness accounts at these parties which have been filmed on video showing that when the police officers are called to these pop-up parties, Nothing is done to break up these parties until there are gunshots fired. There have been several occasions at these pop-up parties where people have been shot and who needed medical assistance. If the police department does in fact have a contingency plan in place for pop-up parties, I respectfully ask the chief of police make this contingency plan available for public review, for transparency. I cannot stress enough the significant danger to public safety and property 
because of these pop-up parties and a lack of law enforcement engagement with those who participate in this lawlessness, which creates mayhem in the neighborhoods. These parties also create a safety hazard for those possible innocent victims who may be involved in a car crash by a driver who is under the influence of alcohol or drugs leaving one of these pop-up parties. In closing, the residents of the inner city older neighborhoods are extremely tired of hearing the excuse from city leaders, there is nothing we can do. Thank you once again and allowing me to speak. Are there any questions? I have a question for the mayor. Sure, all the women purchase. <clears throat> so seeing that we've had multiple pop-up parties on North Grand before I was even here, is there some type of plan in place for another one that may occur? I know that we're not able to see when it happens or when it's occurring. Yeah, I'll have uh, Chief Scarlett, or Assistant Chief Scarlett, speak to that. Um, the challenge is uh, addressing it before it happens. I mean, so if anybody hears uh, or sees something on social media, that's how they uh, communicate it, but the chief, uh, assistant chief can enlighten us, and he'll speak with regards to the police department, um, and this is very challenging. We've seen it during the pandemic. When you have hundreds of people, or I'm not sure how many are out there, probably hundreds, and you only have a few officers, the officer's safety is at stake. And so they do what they can to make sure the area is kept as safe as possible. So, uh, but I let him speak to that, but we saw it play out with protests and everything else. So the pop-up parties is very challenging for the police department. But again, in order for us to address it once and for all, you need citizens engagement. And there are citizens that speak up, young people speak up, and they let the police officers know and that's how we've been able to take guns off the streets. We've been able to head off uh, these pop-up parties at occasions, but uh, it's still going on. And it just takes that citizen's engagement, working with the police department and uh, supporting one another in that effort. So Assistant Chief Scarlett. Thanks, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I need to clarify a few things. And I, I mentioned this several weeks, probably months ago, and I'll say it again. The Springfield Police Department does not turn down the assistance of any other law enforcement agency in this town, whether that's the county sheriffs, whether that's the park uh, police, Leland Grove, Jerome, state police. I've got an operations plan right here which involves a multi-jurisdictional response to these. We do not turn down anyone's assistance. I said that earlier, I'll make that very clear. I think that's an important piece right now. Um, we uh, addressed to, to the gentleman's point, there were several pop-up parties. I think it was the 13th of September, the 20th, and maybe some other ones. We put together a multi-jurisdictional operations plan. The plan is right here. This is something I like to keep near and dear because we don't like to share uh, exactly uh, what our operations are and how we go about business so the public can, uh, you know, that, that's not something that needs to be shared. So, but we do have a plan in place that we uh, that we have used at least four times since uh, September of last year. To the mayor's point, we don't get the benefit of knowing when these when these pop-up parties happen. That's why they call them pop-up parties. This plan right here, when we have intel, this uh, involves about 20 to 25 personnel who come in on their off time. We pay them. This costs thousands of dollars to the city for us to have plans in place when these pop-up parties occur. We need, to the mayor's point again, we need citizen support to say we're done with this. Uh, when we see something, you know, as soon as we can be notified, we can get in there and do our best to absolutely shut this down. But it is manpower intensive. It is dangerous, not only for the residents of the city, but to, to interject our men and women into those situations where there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people and there's a balance there that we have to, to weigh. The, uh, real quick to add on to that, uh, the one thing we will be taking a look at is a camera system. We talked about LPRs here. But really for uh, ones that occur at the quick and easy, I think that's happened twice now for uh, businesses maybe uh, forming a partnership where I'm not sure the cost of those, uh, but that's something we'd take a look at and maybe sharing the cost uh, associated with those. Can I? Can I? Sure. I'm sorry. If I and could just touch on one thing purchase. you brought up. 
a point. I apologize. Uh, regarding quick and easy, I think it's important to point out we do have a good working relationship with them. Our sergeant called them uh, this uh, past Sunday morning at 143 and said, there's a large crowd gathering. Would you like me to disperse them? He then called for six to seven additional officers, and in the course of 20 minutes, they were able to push those people off the parking lot. Quick and easy is willing to turn out the lights and shut things down in an effort to try and uh, persuade uh, individuals hanging out to move on. So we do have a good partnership, a good working relationship with them. Other one to purchase? I was just going to, well, he just said some of it just then, but in the, in the, um, and my thoughts to the response, how many officers showed up at this time? Because I know just earlier we were talking about how we have to have so many officers at these 3 a.m. bars. Are we having that same situation when we have pop-up parties? Oh, 100%. And this was so uh, this incident that happened uh, this past uh, Sunday, it was actually a small event. There might have been 60 vehicles there. Our officers were made, uh, observed it, made the phone call to Quick and Easy, had six to seven show up, which, again, is slightly less than half of the officers working for the city of Springfield at that time, and were able to push the vehicles out. So. Now, Chief, is there any way that um, I'm not for sure, or if, if I'm incorrect, please correct me, but if it's on Quick and Easy parking lot or somewhere else like the Shop and Save, are we able to call tow trucks in to remove some of these cars and, and push them out if they don't want to move within 10 or 15 minutes because you, we're so short on manpower? You've got to have a certain... Um, uh, agreements already in place as far as that goes. Any any movement of vehicles from private property, however, is going to be up to the owner's responsibility to do that. What we have done and uh, arrangements that we've made with business owners up at that area of 4th and North Grand is there are uh, owners are willing to block off their parking lots, which is important, you know, to put something across uh, the entryways so that cars can't get in there. And so we do have, again, uh, partnerships with businesses up in that area and all throughout the city who we try and make suggestions like, hey, this is a way to keep your parking lot clear. Lighting, uh, you know, there's uh, cameras, there's all sorts of things that, uh, that we encourage businesses to do as well. Okay. Any other discussion on that point? Alderman Gregory? I, I do agree with, with one of the points that was made tonight. You know, we, I respect our police department. They're, they're, they're working hard, short staff, and, and we as a community got to step up and, and call out these bad actors and, 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 um, and really help them keep our community safe. Uh, we've been through some rough times together as a community, and we've gotten through them. And, and I think we need to put away all of whatever it is, and we really got to work together. Um, there's some people listening to me and watching um, this meeting tonight. And, and I really want to just, just say it for me in the news. You play something important that we really, really as a community have to, you know, I don't know if, you know, I, I, I got to, 14 year old son and, and you know the other day I, I sat down and talked to him about if he had a stinking gun a good kid but I want to know and, and, and we have to start taking more proactive measures I've talked to Chief about really trying to figure out where all these stinking guns is coming from in our, in our, in our community and trying to get down to that and I agree with you and I'm going to do all I can to really energize the community to really call out these bad actors and really put pressure on them um, that we don't want it in our communities. We want to have fun. Everybody's okay with having fun. But when we bring all these, these, these guns into play and people are getting shot, it's going to draw our attention. So anybody's listening to me, if you have a business, if you want to have fun, and if you pull these guns out, you're going to draw our attention and we are going to act. So it, it just is what it is. Um, you know, I, I don't want anybody to get it confused. That, 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 you know, any, anybody, uh, me anyway, um, it, it is not for law and order because I'm very, very for law and order. I think I've shown that um, with some of the actions that we've taken in, in, in War II about pop-up parties and everything else. And, and we'll put out that same message again that, you know, we'll, we'll do everything we can. We'll block off the whole stinking area if we got to for a few weeks but um, and go after the culprits who are having them. No problem. But but I, I just wanted to put that out there, put that call out there um, that, that, that we all need to really, really bond together and get this stuff handled. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Yeah, Alderman uh, Williams. I, I just want to thank the police because uh, it is challenging. I think my first, within my first month, I experienced the pop-up. I got a call in the middle of the night 
uh, woman said to me, uh, Alderman Williams, I just got off my shift and I can't get home. And I, I said, well, what do you mean? And she was ex describing these, well, she was saying 500 cars, you know. Uh, it was the Pillsbury pop-up, if you remember. So I told her, I said, well, call the police. And she said, well, I'm standing here with the police. And so uh, what we ended up doing, she ended up parking somewhere by Lanfear, and then the police walked her off, you know, up to her, her house. But uh, she really let me have it, telling me that it's a shame I can't get to my driveway when I get off my shift from work to go home, and even the police can't get me there. So, you know, I, I did the alderman thing. Well, I'm sorry, and we got to try to figure it out. But when I went out there, I, I was just amazed at... Uh, of all the violations, not just the noise violation, because everybody's music was blasting, the parking violations, noise viol just all these cold violations was going on. And I talked to a, a couple of the officers, uh, but I dare not say to them, go do something. <laughs> because it was like 500 to one, you know. Because now it might be 500 cars, but it, it, it's probably one or 2,000 kids or young people, I'll just say, young people. So I would never encourage the police to attempt, but, but my thought that night was to surround them with, I was being crazy, new, new aldermen, you know, surround them with tow trucks, you know. And, and then once we got them surrounded, we're going to tow them one, but, you know, Winslow quickly. No, we, <laughs> that ain't happening, you know. So I think what the solution is, is, is not being discussed enough. I don't think we talk about what a solution is. I think we need some kind of a task force or subcommittee or something, Mayor, where we put together uh, a few neighborhood associations with the police, uh, with a few aldermen, maybe not all of us, but a few of us, and, and we really brainstorm this thing, whether we do research what happens in other cities when this happens, um, because I know it can be fixed. Now, I had a friend as an alderman in another location that told me, you gotta offer award money. So you have to say to these kids on your own social media, you know, anybody know about it and you give us the, the, the information early enough, you get this many, you know, much money. And, and it, it, it tended to work for them, you know. So what I would say, uh, I'm open to any kind of options and any kind of suggestions and discussion uh, because we can't just sit here and just say, well, we do what we can. And we do have the law enforcement contingency plan, but what about the community plan? What about the citizen plan? What we want to do because we know more than what we realize. We just don't talk to each other enough and share that information with each other to prevent these things. There's hints out there. There's things. Now, they went to talking in cold, mm -hmm. you know, so I couldn't understand the Facebook and the Instagram, all that mess. But I still believe that if the people come together and we have meetings and we discuss these things, we can figure some of these things out. Whether it's, like I said, copy the others, you know, do this little reward thing maybe as an incentive if you help us. You get this money, you know, and that prevents it. We prevented it one time. Well, we thought we prevented it. And uh, I worked with Alderman Greg and, and Chief Winslow and some of the police. We stopped it at Comer Cox, but they jumped on us and went to another location. Mm -hmm. So I know it's challenging. I, I really want the citizens to understand we, we do want to fix it. We do want to try it. And you never know when it's going to just out of nowhere appear. But I appreciate you guys because I know you take a hit for it's like, okay, a few months go by, and boom, we have another one, boom. And then it really gets extreme when it happens in an area that never happened before. It just really freaks everybody out, that many cars at one time in that place. Sometimes I think we make a mistake. We've done it several times tonight. We talk about our manpower strength in the public. Yeah. So the kids know, oh, it's only 16 officers on duty. Well, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I know we mean well, and we're having a discussion about other things, but uh, Chief, sometimes I think that, that can hurt, you know, when they don't know. That's why I'm glad you didn't go into what your contingency with the other law enforcement officers are. But I think we need to create some kind of body that works on this. I'm sure all the women purchase will help. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and all the Williamson will have someone from the police and the ICON as well. And 
other neighborhood associations. And I just wanted to say something to you tonight because I received dozens of calls. I live right down the street from Quick and Easy in Enos Park. So not only was I receiving calls from Enos Park, but I was in Lincoln Park. So I had to let everyone know that I am taking this very serious, but this doesn't just happen in 24 hours to fix the situation. And to Alderman Williams, I'm a lot younger, so I know that it takes like just 20 minutes when they're on Snapchat to, to send this <laughs> over to you because you don't re you don't understand how Snapchat works. I don't. I'll be <laughs> That's why I said it. I don't understand the language they But use. we talk to each other like that, so I'm not picking yeah. on him. Yeah. But they do it in 20 minutes, so it's really hard for you to catch them. And some of the same people who have had these previous pop-up parties are now using other people's accounts or using a fake account. But you did catch the guy that did one of them, didn't you? Didn't yes. we? That's uh, correct. In charge of it. There's a couple times we've identified mm -hmm. organizers and, and okay. elder responsible. Yes. And, and I would just like to group it. together. If I could just yep, yep, say sure. I appreciate your, your both of y'all's comments and the willingness to work together. I mean, I think that's what we need as a city is to all be able to hands on deck for this problem. And, and I'll be the first to admit I don't have all the answers. So getting a collaboration of group together to, to brainstorm is a good idea for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank we'll you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wish to address the council? Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. Aye. We're well, adjourned. Thank well, you. Look, I ain't. <laughs> look, I'm not. I came prepared. I, I put a jacket on. I was ready. I don't know why she calls us old all the time. She does that every week. She can knock it off with that.